One and all, my name is Ira Robinson, and I want to welcome you guys to one, uh, what should prove to be a great episode of Late Night in the Midlands. Tonight, Michael Vera is taking the night off, unfortunately, not through uh, anything of his own fault. He has some very major storms happening down in his area, and he lost internet connection a few times today, and uh, is currently actually off the internet um, due to the storms down there. So uh, he asked if I could prepare to uh, do the show tonight in his place, just in case. And uh, it appears that that is going to be the case tonight. So hello, one and all. Hopefully you guys don't mind me taking over the show. Once again, you guys heard me uh, a couple of weeks ago for the entire week. And uh, hopefully this is not an indication of how the week is going to go. So, um, But uh, that's OK either way. Uh, tonight we have uh, as the guest Byron Belitsos, and it is going to be a really interesting conversation, I think. Uh, Byron is an expert when it comes to the Urantia book and uh, all of the things that are associated with it. And so uh, it's a it's a subject that I've had some fascination with over the years, and I've read it a couple of times myself. So it's going to be very interesting to talk to somebody who has a lot of experience in the subject and a lot of knowledge in the subject. So we will be taking your calls tonight for Byron as well. Um, make sure that you uh, know that the number is different than the usual number. It will be 260-494-3937. That's again, 260-494-3937. And uh, you can also contact me on my Skype line. That is JDA Film. I know it's an odd one, but that's okay. It's an old account, and uh, it's the one that we have to use. So that's a little odd. Um, you can also go to lnmradionetwork.com and make sure that you join in on the chat room there. Uh, go to lnmradionetwork.com, click on the chat and listen button. It's a big red blinking button on the top of the page, and you can't miss it. I'm blind, and even I can see it. So uh, make sure that you go there, join the community, join the chat. If you guys do not want to give a call, but you want to ask questions to the guest, my uh, producer slash wife is currently in the room there. Her name is Jolene, and she will be uh, taking any personal messages that you want to send her way as far as questions or comments or concerns or anything like that is concerned. And uh, she will make sure that I get them and will ask the guest for you. Again, though, we would prefer that you guys give us a call. So um, I do have a little bit of news. Before I get to the news, though, I want to make sure to uh, stress that at this point in time, it is the end of the month and we have fallen short on donations and subscriptions. So please, uh, those of you who like to wait till the last minute, well, this is it. This is the last minute. Um, so we really could use the help. Make sure that you go to lnmradionetwork.com, click on the subscribe button, uh, become a subscriber. Not only do you help support this radio network and all of the things that we do, but you also get access now to the uh, archives. Um, those of you who are not aware, uh, the first hour of each uh, Late Night in the Midlands show is available for free for anybody to listen to. But the last two hours, we've had to lock up the accounts 
um, simply because of the amount of piracy that was going on with the shows and people making some serious profit off of the work that Michael Vera has done here for the past eight years. It was a shame that we had to do things that way, but that's the way it goes. Um, so make sure that you go there again, lnmradionetwork.com. Click on the subscribe button. Click on the donate button if you guys can't subscribe uh, for each uh, person that donates. You know, if you are kind of a, a frequent flyer donator, that kind of thing, you'll also get access to the archives. You don't have to be a subscriber. Mainly, we just are, are looking for people that are willing to come forward and help us to survive here. There's a lot of stuff that's going on in the world, and we really do need the help to get everything out. So let's get to some news. Um, the first bit of news that I ran across now, granted, uh, all of these news articles, they're not on the network uh, site yet. Normally, the news is posted there before the shows begin, but since uh, Michael was having difficulties today. He didn't have a chance to get them there and neither did I because it was kind of a last minute thing coming here. Um, but, uh, they will be there after the show. I'll work on posting them. So, uh, you guys can make sure that, um, you'll see the articles there, but again, lnmradionetwork.com, you can uh, go there and you'll be able to find these articles. Pope Francis will meet with homeless people, immigrants, and prisoners during his upcoming trip to Cuba and the United States and become the first pope to address the U.S. Congress. He'll also preside over a meeting about religious liberty, a major issue for U.S. bishops in the wake of the Supreme Court's gay marriage decision. The Vatican published the itinerary on Tuesday for the eagerly awaited September 19th to 28th visit. Boy, everything is happening right during that time period, right? Francis added the Cuba leg onto the start of his U.S. trip after helping contribute to the historic thaw in the U.S.-Cuba relations. In Cuba, he'll celebrate Mass in Revolution Square in Havana, as both of his immediate predecessors did during their trips to the Car uh, Caribbean island nation. He'll also travel to Hoguin and pray before the Virgin of Charity of Cobre, the patron of Cuba, and meet with Cuban families in the eastern city of Santiago. Francis arrives in Washington, D.C. on September 22nd, and the next day he will be welcomed at the White House by President Barack Obama. He will address Congress on September 24th, and he will meet with homeless people later in the day at a local parish, St. Patrick's. On September 25th, Francis will speak on sustainable development at the United Nations, where he'll have another opportunity to voice his concerns about the environment. <sighs> Republicans in the U.S. Congress and even some Republican U.S. presidential candidates have largely shrugged off Francis's denunciation of the current global economic system in which he says wealthy countries exploit the poor and pollute the earth in the process. Now, this is pretty big news. I mean, the fact that the, the Pope and his little hat are coming here to the United States and addressing Congress for the first time by any Pope, that's pretty major news, a pretty major event. Um, I brought news out on my show, Open Eyes, uh, a few weeks ago about the uh, UN summit that's going to be taking place in September. There are a lot of things that are going into this summit that are very, very um, concerning to someone like me who pays attention to the um, sideline issues that people tend to get distracted away from. They are going to be doing things to basically elevate third world countries up and bring first world countries down to make everybody at an equal status. Um, lots of different things going on. It's not just a climate summit, despite what people may think. Also, what comes to my mind with this article is that when the Pope visited, I believe it was Argentina about six or seven months ago or so. Um, before he arrived, the police actually went through the town and arrested and jailed many um, homeless children, children on the streets, so that their uh, visit, the, the visit by the Pope, he would not see all of the, the homeless children that were there and so on and so forth. It was very um, controversial, to say the least. So that's that's kind of something that comes to my mind with this is are we going to see the same thing occur in uh, Washington, D.C. 
there are a lot of homeless that live there. And uh, a lot of people are very aware of the Pope's visit and uh, are, are very um, concerned about appearance. Let's just put it to you that way. So the next article Tonight, an illusion will make it appear as if the planets Jupiter and Venus have merged in the western horizon, giving off the appearance of a superstar. The site will be visible in North America in that direction just after sunset, so right about now, here. Every night this month, the two planets have appeared to get closer to one another. Tonight, they will be just one-third of a degree apart and appear to merge into one big, bright, shining object in the sky. Jupiter will appear circular, and Venus will form a crescent around it. Some have claimed that tonight's rare planetary alignment was once responsible for the so-called Star of Bethlehem. Sky and Telescope suggest that a similar rare conjunction of Venus and Jupiter may have been what's called the Star of Bethlehem in 3 or 2 BC. There has not been a brighter, closer planetary conjunction in the 2,000 years since. So this is a, a pretty interesting and, and a kind of, I guess you could say, almost an epic conjunction that is occurring. I, uh, I'm not one that puts much stock into like the whole um, astrology and, and so on and so forth. But I do understand the way that history works and the way that uh, people have paid attention to these things over the years. And the fact that this is the first occurrence since that date in time, it's pretty interesting, especially considering all of the culmination of events that we've got going on at this moment in time. It kind of would uh, appear to be the perfect time for another Christ to make an appearance and say, hey, I can fix things. <laughs> Whether that's uh, for good or bad, I'll leave up to you guys. That's a whole topic in and of itself. But uh, anyway, so you guys can... Uh, Go out and take a look during the uh, commercial break that we'll have coming up here in just a bit and uh, see if you guys can see it. And if you can, let me know. I, I personally, I would not be able to see it because of my blindness. So <laughs> kind of uh, kind of out of luck either way. I'll, I'll have to hope that somebody takes pictures and sends them my way. So speaking about um, the same sex uh, issue um, that is going to be on Pope Francis's agenda the U S states right now, there's, there's quite a few of them that are really trying to buck the system when it comes to the Supreme court's decision on Friday regarding gay marriage and same sex marriage and all of the things that are now associated with it. Some of the states are trying to do what they can to, um, get away from having to be, um, supplanted basically under that ruling. And, uh, so this article goes into some pretty good detail about some of the changes that they're trying to make to circumvent this decision that the court made. And let me add as well, um, last night on, on the last night's episode of late night in the Midlands, go back in the archives and take a listen later. Um, Michael Vera made a, a pretty good rant about some of the events that occurred over this weekend in quote unquote celebration of this same sex marriage ruling. And I have to say, I don't disagree with his uh, opinion of it at all. Texas attorney general Ken Paxton has deemed state employees exempt from granting same sex couples with marriage licenses. If it violates their religious beliefs, conservative lawmakers in Tennessee have started drafting legislation that would protect religious leaders from being forced to preside over same sex marriages Utah and Mississippi are considering doing away with state-issued marriage license altogether, while county clerks in Kentucky and Alabama have already taken it upon themselves to stop granting licenses altogether. While such pushback looks poised to provoke legal action, constitutional law expert Greg uh, Majerian, a professor of law at Washington University in St. Louis, said that most of these state efforts are the political equivalent of temper tantrums, Attention getting yet extremely difficult to implement moves to stop issuing marriage licenses to anyone for one thing are highly problematic. If a state continues to recognize religious marriages, but doesn't offer any legal opportunity for same sex marriage, uh, the state will inevitably inevitably end up handing out marriage based benefits only to those who have participated in a religious ceremony, which is unconstitutional. 
It would only be a matter of time, Majerian predicted, before someone who doesn't want a religious ceremony sues the state for discriminating against their religion or lack thereof by preventing them from having a civil ceremony. They're going to win, and the state will be ordered to start issuing civil marriage licenses again. You can stand in the corner. This is a, a quote from him, and I like this one. You can stand in the corner and hold your breath until you're blue in the face, but people in your state will still be signing up for Obamacare, only now you've given the authority over it to the federal government. From a political perspective, he said, daring the federal government to take over a long-held state responsibility like marriage would be a strategically stupid move. And I have to agree with that assessment uh, pretty well. Um, when it comes to the issue of same sex marriage, I mean, my opinion is, is my own opinion and, uh, some people may disagree with it, but that's okay. Uh, if, if everybody, you know, to, to be fair, I mean, equal rights do have to be there. There, there's no reason not to grant equal rights to them, but on the same token at, at the same time, um, the same sex couples who want to get married, need to leave the religious people alone if they don't want to do anything to participate in their ceremonies. Both sides need to stop forcing each other to do things against their will and just leave each other alone. Maybe then we can actually deal with some of the real issues that are going on in this nation, such as this. Governor Jerry Brown wasted no time on Tuesday in signing a contentious California bill to impose one of the strictest school vaccination laws in the country following an outbreak of measles at Disneyland late last year. I uh, had on my show um, about a month and a half ago or so, Landy Cryer, who is an activist in California, who is trying to come forward with information about this uh, bill that they have now passed in California. And um, it's pretty devastating. It's, it's pretty sad that they have done this. Brown, a Democrat, issued a signing statement just one day after lawmakers sent him the bill to strike California's personal belief exemption for immunizations, a move that requires nearly all public school children to now be vaccinated. The bill takes effect next year. A quote from Brown, the science is clear that vaccines dramatically protect children against a number of infectious and dangerous diseases. And while it's true that no medical intervention is without risk, the evidence shows that immunization powerfully benefits and protects the community. What lies? California jo joins Mississippi and West Virginia as the only states with such strict requirements. Democratic Senators Richard Pan of Sacramento and Ben Allen of Santa Monica introduced the measure after the outbreak at the theme park in December infected over 100 people in the U.S. and Mexico. The bill likely would be successful in increasing immunization rates and stopping the spread of disease, according to pediatric do uh, doctors, after the state Senate sent the legislation to the governor. Bill supporters, including doctors, hospital representatives, and health advocates, celebrated at an elementary school on Tuesday. Lawmakers held babies, declaring the public would be better protected as a result of the bill. Pan said, the science is clear. Boy, that quote is being thrown about so heavily, not just with this climate change and on and on and on. Californians have spoken. The governor and the legislature have spoken. No more preventable contagions. No more outbreaks. No more hospitalizations. No more deaths. And no more fear. Wow. Really? Wow. Okay, so if there is another outbreak of any kind in that state, can we now hold him accountable for it? Because he claims that there is going to be no more. We have to start holding these people absolutely responsible. This guy... It has been proven over and over, has been paid off by the lobbies that are in support of these vaccinations. That's who has backed this bill. There were more signatures on a petition uh, designed to get this whole thing to stop. There were over 65,000 signatures on a petition trying to drive the point home in California that this needs to be stopped. 30,000 were uh, signed on an opposing petition saying that it needs to go through. 
Guess which one got the most publicity? They got a press conference and everything, and that one had 30,000 signatures. The one that had twice as much got nothing. (laughs) Nothing at all. Yeah, the science is clear, the science is settled, and that's it, and that's all, right? Yeah, okay. So, uh, solid job growth is finally boosting paychecks for the rest of us. Incomes for the bottom 99% of American families rose 3.3% last year to $47,213, the biggest annual gain in the past 15 years, according to data compiled by economist Emmanuel Saez and released on Monday by the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. For the bottom 99% of income earners, this marks the first year of real recovery from the income losses sparked by the Great Recession. The increase likely reflects robust hiring last year when employers added 3.1 million jobs, the most since 1999. That lowered the unemployment rate to 5.6% from 6.7% a year earlier. Strong job gains and a falling in unemployment can help broadly raise incomes as businesses are forced to offer higher pay to attract workers. With more money in their wallets, Americans are spending more freely. Auto sales reached the highest level in nearly a decade in May. Sales of clothing and building materials also jumped last month, and home sales are at an eight-year high. Still, income inequality worsened in 2014. The richest 1% of Americans posted a much bigger increase in pay. Their income soared an average of 10.8% to $1.3 million. The wealthiest 1% also captured 21.2% of all income in 2014, up from 20.1% the previous year. Now, as far as I'm concerned, I guess that uh, my family falls within the 1% because we didn't gain anything last year. We, we didn't get any kind of increase in any way. So I guess technically, if the 99% have raised up, we can actually now be classed in the 1%. <laughs> I guess that's good for us. Anyways, this, uh, this article, I think, is kind of important to look at because they, they show if you read carefully and if you're knowledgeable about how the economy really works you can see how the numbers are really being finagled all the way around our employment our unemployment rate is much much higher than 5.6 percent i know more people out of a hundred that are unemployed than five i'll just tell you that right now um we are being lied to about the unemployment rate about the amount of homelessness, about the amount of income, the income inequality, all of this stuff is a lie. (laughs) The, The science is not settled on this account. Let's just put it to you that way. And finally, the last article for you guys, President Obama has now signed into law the so called fast track bill, setting the stage for approval of the controversial trans Pacific partnership. The Fast Track Bill, officially known as the Trade Promotion Authority, or TPA, was one of two bills signed by Obama. The president also signed the Trade Adjustment Assistance, or TAA Act, which is supported, I'm sorry, which is supposed to extend aid to workers who might lose their job as a consequence of the TPP or other so called free trade deals. Following the signing, Darlene Superville, White House reporter for the Associated Press, tweeted, uh, The POTUS at Trade Bill Signing said, I thought I'd start off the week with something we should do more often, a truly bipartisan bill signing. Despite the bipartisan nature of the bill, President Obama acknowledged the hurdles that remain for the TPP. We still have tough negotiations that are going to be taking place. The debate will not end with this bill signing. Um... CNET reports that an Australian parliamentary committee has released a blind agreement report warning of an impeding or I'm sorry, of an impending attack on Internet freedoms and criticizing the negotiations at lacking oversight and scrutiny. The joint parliamentary report stated that parliament is faced with an all or nothing choice and is being kept in the dark. Parliament should play a constructive role during negotiations and not merely rubber stamp agreements that have been negotiated behind closed doors. With the passing of the TPA and the TAA, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is possibly only weeks away from approval. The trade agreement has been notoriously secret, with the public only viewing chapters of the text, which have been leaked by WikiLeaks. We are in a lot of trouble, folks. 
I'll just put it to you that way. I've been screaming from the rooftops about the TPP for months now. And uh, if it gets signed into place, we're done. Stick a spork in us. We are finished. America, as we know it, is gone. We will be welcoming the new fascist state, literally. The definition of a fascist state is when a country is owned and run by the corporations. And that's exactly what will happen with the Trans-Pacific Partnership once he signs it into place. And you can guarantee he's going to make it happen. He has claimed that he wants this to be a part of his legacy when he leaves office by the time that his term is complete. So, folks, coming up next after the break, we are going to have Brian Belitz, uh, sorry, Byron Belitzos. <laughs> I'm sorry, Byron Belitzos. He is a multiple award-winning author and book publisher and is also an editor and educator. After founding Origin Press in 1996, he has worked with numerous leading authors, including Jim Mars. Byron is also known as a leading expert on the Urantia book and has written, spoken, and given workshops widely on its teachings. He has co-authored or edited and published five previous books about the Urantia revelations, most recently The Adventure of Being Human Part 2, Healing a Broken World, and The Adventure of Being Human, Part 1. So, when we come back from the break, we will have Byron on, and um, I think that it's going to be a really interesting conversation. I'm really looking forward to it, and I hope that you guys are too. We will be taking your calls. You can call into 260-494-3937 after we get rolling for a little while, probably after the second break. And in the meantime, stick around with us. We'll be back in just a few minutes. Radio Network and Late Night in the Midlands depends on you, the listener. Without you, there would be no us. So help us continue to bring you the best guests with the best information and subscribe today. Information on becoming an LM subscriber can be found at the top of late night in the Midlands.com. Just click the About Subscriptions tab and become part of the family while helping the truth stay alive. And while you're at it, maybe subscriptions aren't for you. A one-time donation helps as well. Click that donate button on the right side of LateNightInTheMidlands.com and help us help you. We believe in the truth of the following statements. All people are created equal, and they are created with certain rights no one should ever take, including life, liberty, and trying to do what makes them happy. To make sure people have these rights, we create government that gets its power from the people being governed. And if any form of government starts destroying these rights, it's also their right to alter it or do away with it and then to install new government which they feel is the most likely to give them safety and happiness. We're not saying that governments that have been in existence for some time should be changed or tossed aside lightly on a whim. In fact, experience shows us that people are more likely to suffer under evil government as long as they can stand it rather than to stand up and do something but when they're abused for a long time and the things that belong to them are increasingly taken away for the same reasons and benefiting the same tightly knit group of people who rule with absolute political power then it's the people's right and their duty to throw off that kind of government and to find new guardians of their future.
Welcome back to Late Night in the Midlands. My name is Ira Robinson, and I want to thank you guys for sticking around through that break. Uh, tonight, Michael Vera once again is off. Uh, he is not off intentionally. It is because he has some major, major storm activity going on down in his area. And uh, he lost Internet uh, at least five times during the uh, course of the evening and is now basically off completely. Um, and I don't mean off his rocker or anything. I mean off the internet. Um, although most people might claim that it's the otherwise. So, uh, anyway, so you guys are going to have me tonight. Um, and, uh, hopefully he will be back and, and, uh, in full force again tomorrow evening. Uh, once again, tonight we have Byron Belitzos and, uh, I hope that I'm pronouncing his, his name correctly. It might be Belitzos. Uh, I'll be sure to ask him for, uh, for sure. But, uh, anyways, Tonight is going to be a, a very interesting conversation, I think, about the Urantia topic, and uh, it's one that I find really fascinating. So go to lnmradionetwork.com. Make sure that you join the chat room with the uh, chat and listen button at the top of the page. Join the community and make sure that you uh, ask your questions there uh, if you do not want to give a call. Again, the phone number to call in is 260-494-3937. That's 260-494-EYES. I try to make it as easy as I can for you guys. So let's see if we can get a hold of Byron here, shall we? And of course, we're going to have a few issues here. I'll tell you what, let's, uh, let me go ahead and hit a real quick music interlude here again real fast and uh, make sure of uh, what's happening. I think there, there's an issue with my Skype. So stick around. Uh, sorry about this. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Alrighty, there we go. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, had to uh, make sure that my Skype got fixed. Let's go ahead and see if we can get a hold of Byron now, shall we? You gotta love live radio. This is Byron. Hello, Byron. My name is Ira Robinson, and I'm calling from Late Night in the Midlands. Um, Michael Vera had to take the evening off tonight. His uh, internet connection went really bad. He's got a lot of storms in his area. So I'm going to be doing your interview tonight, if you are all ready for it. Yeah, I'm all ready for it. And again, you, what was your name again? My name is Ira. Hi, Ira. We are Thanks live. Thanks for doing the interview. Oh, you you bet. I've actually been looking really forward to this. I've, uh, I've read the Urantia book myself a few times, and uh, I, I'm always fascinated by the subject. I know our listeners are really uh, tuned in and, and listening and looking forward to, to hearing what you have to say on the topic. Um, before we uh, get like fully rolling, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and uh, some, you know, like where your background is, where you're coming from and that sort of thing. Uh, okay. Well, uh, I guess we're on the air then. Yes, sir. We are live. Okay, I'm sorry, I wasn't sure. Well, Ira, it's, uh, again, great to be on the show, and uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I, I hail from the uh, middle part of the country also. I'm from Cincinnati and uh, went to school in Chicago and other places, uh, did graduate work also at uh, University of California, Berkeley, and University of California, Santa Cruz. <clears throat> my, most of my work was in history, and particularly history of religion, um, history of ideas and philosophy, but I'm a I'm a generalist, uh, and um, what made me a generalist I, I really have no idea. But these days, you know, I publish 
books, all kinds of nonfiction books. So you have to be kind of a general interest person to do that. And so I, I publish books in, uh, for about the last 20 years, I published books in health and spirituality, uh, a little bit in science and in politics, history. And lately, uh, I have been publishing books about the Urantia book, actually for now over 10 years. And, uh, you know, it's become a favorite subject for me. I've spent 40 years, believe it or not, studying the text and teaching and writing about it. And, um, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's endlessly fascinating. And so I'm happy to get into any topic you, that you'd like tonight. I am definitely looking forward to it myself. I've, uh, I find the topic of the Urantia book in general really fascinating, like the story of how it came about and all of that, you know, just even that alone is, is really cool. Um, what, uh, what is Urantia and what does it mean? Yeah, the word Urantia is a, is a coined term. It was, uh, you know, sort of coined by the celestial authors, and it means literally the name of our planet, planet Earth. Planet Earth is called Urantia. And, you know, it's funny that most people on, on the planet Urantia don't know the name of their own planet, but <laughs> that is indeed the name according to this purported revelation. And, by the way, the name Urantia is trademarked by the original Urantia Foundation, and uh, they keep, keep kind of a tight uh, tight control on it, or they used to in any case. But that's what Urantia means. It's it's us, our planet. And you said this was, now, like I said, I, I know the, the story behind it, but just for the listener's sake, you said that it was uh, given by celestial beings. Can you go into the background of how it came about? Uh, sure, I'm happy to do it. Uh, it's, it's a disputed uh, story, but we... Almost everybody agrees on uh, certain outlines of it, which is that there was a contact that began uh, sometime between 1910 and 1920 with some people in Chicago, and um, th th these were, you know, fairly ordinary people. It was like a kind of an Edgar Casey type of a contact, where there was somebody that would, uh, in, in deep sleep, would speak. Um, and, um, you know, strange things were coming through this guy. Uh, and eventually the, 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 this uh, couple, actually, that it started out with a couple and a few other people, they found their way to a famous, well-known um, uh, physician and psychiatrist named Dr. Bill Sadler. And he he was actually trying to debunk the whole thing. And, in fact, he had spent some time debunking other mediums and uh, he became, you know, entranced by this thing. He just couldn't explain it. And he and his wife, Lena Sadler, who also was a physician, um, after about oh, many years' engagement with the phenomenon, decided to kind of dive in with it. And uh, soon thereafter, in early 1920s, the, uh, these beings who were speaking through this guy said, we are going to give you a book. We've been talking to you for all these years to prepare you, and the book will be a great revelation. So um, the text of the Urantia book began to, uh, according to the story that I that I uh, subscribe to, it 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 appeared, it materialized, it it was not channeled uh, through anybody, and. Um, Yes, they were speaking through the what they call the the sleeping subject, the contact person who was sort of like an Edgar Casey. They were speaking informally through him, but when the formal text came through, it would appear handwritten uh, in various places. Uh, you know, you, you know, in this guy's bedroom, actually, <clears throat> or in a safe. So the pa these papers would uh, uh, appear and disappear. And the way they did it was they uh, they produced a chapter at a time, and there are 196 chapters. It's a lot of chapters. They're called papers. They would produce these papers. They would appear um, completely ha uh, done, handwritten, in perfect grammar. And a group that gathered around Dr. Sadler and his wife began to read the papers and feed questions to the celestials. 
they would feed questions to them through the sleeping subject. And then they would uh, they would edit the paper. They, the Celestials, would edit the paper, and uh, they would produce a new draft. And you can imagine that this could take a long time, and it took over 20 years uh, for this uh, for them to go through the paper, 196 papers, have people read them, feed questions, uh, and bring these papers forward. And it was by the time of World War II that they uh, had accumulated the full text or, or just before World War II, and they went through it again, and the Celestials uh, did a, like another round of editing and it, it's not clear exactly how that occurred, but then uh, by the end of the war, uh, they had the completed text, and uh, it took them a number of years to get it typeset and printed. Uh, and in fact, the Celestials told them to hold the text uh, a, a little bit uh, after the war because you know everything was so unsettled in the world, and so they, they published it finally in 1995. So that, that's like a real short summary of the story, but there, other people have other stories. So I noticed the timing with it, too, um, with their publication of it was actually not long after the incident at Roswell, New Mexico, and uh, the events that occurred there, as well as other um, alleged crashes that were during that same time period. Do you, and I know this probably may not be something that you think about often, but do you think that maybe there is a relation between um, the the beings that crashed here, for instance, and the celestials? Uh, actually, it is something I do think about, um, and, um, you know, not real often, but, uh, you know, I speak at UFO conferences and you know, just came back from the Contact in the Desert conference where I spoke about the Rancher book. But, um, you know, I don't think there's a, a direct connection, um, but there was this tremendous interest in planet Earth, Urantia, uh, particularly after uh, World War uh, II, um, because it had entered an incredibly dangerous phase. And so, it's you know, it's no accident that you know, higher beings, celestial beings, were intervening, you know, in various ways. And it's my my view that um, the extraterrestrials work with the work with the interdimensionals, you know, uh, to to minister to us. However, you know, we have a big problem, which is on uh, on our planet there is a split in 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 the heavenly realms between sort of the dark forces and the light forces. So it makes it pretty complicated. So you know, uh, you know, so it's Roswell and all the other you know, or contacts, um, many that uh, are, you know, much lesser known, you know, really have to do with the evolution of, of consciousness on this planet and at a time when we, we can't handle it anymore. We need off-planet help. So the, it all comes together, and the Urantia book is, you know, one of, one of the central manifestations of that, in my view. Do you think um, that maybe they have actually done this type of thing in other planets as well, or is this just something that we've had here? This is something that, you know, the revelation always occurs on other planets uh, in, in a kind of a uh, sort of a, pr a protocol that they, that they have uh, uh, established uh, for planets. And uh, so uh, they, they say there's a kind of a, uh, a rhythm between evolution, natural evolution, you know, just biological, genetic evolution, and evolution of consciousness. It just goes naturally. And then there's times when you kind of peak out and you can't really get anywhere in uh, natural evolution. You need help from above. So any normal planet would evolve naturally, and then there would be, uh, times of uh, off-planet uh, divine intervention to move them forward, and in our, but in our case, uh, the interventions are uh, all of them are highly uh, are ad hoc uh, interventions there uh, because of the disturbances that we had right from the very beginning, which I, I'm sure we'll get into. Yeah, most definitely. Um... One other than uh, maybe sideline question is, do you think that with the uh, timing of things that it had to do with the fact that now 
we had access to and um, were making use of nuclear energy with like nuclear weapons and, and uh, nuclear power plants and so on and so forth, that maybe that was like a, um, a cue for them to know that we were ready for it, perhaps? That was a cue for them that we were, uh, we were totally off the rails. Uh, that uh, when you have uh, technology of that sort, that you have an immature, uh, you know, prim- really primitive civilization with weapons of that sort, then you definitely need uh, off-planet help before you blow everything up. Yeah, it's like giving a monkey a flamethrower. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. It's not going to work out well for the forest <laughs> around it, that's for sure. <laughs> So yeah, I mean because we are we are loved and we are we are ministered to, and you know normal planets, this is done in an orderly way. But in a dis in a disordered planet like ours, it's done in an experimental ad hoc way with you know spectacular attempts to break through. And you know so far, much of the interventions that have occurred have have actually failed or or have semi failed so we we can uh, dive into that at any point but uh, you know we, the, the, the listeners just give them a kind of the, the capsule overview if you're if they're new to this the um, you know a normal planet would have natural evolution up to a certain point when the indigenous sort of the tribes of the planet have have uh, you know have have populated uh, the planet and have, you know, de- you know, developed there's some very primitive technology and they have languages and and they maybe have invented the wheel and things of that nature. But uh, they know uh, that um, that there's a limit to uh, to evolution without outside intervention. It's just designed that way. And uh, but what what we should rather think of is how amazing natural evolution is. Uh, natural evolution can really generate fantastic things without, without off-planet intervention. And that's why there's so many people around who think there really is no off-planet you know, forces. Because when you study evolution, it really looks self-sufficient. And, um, but, uh, but the broad expanse of, of things... Uh, if if you look deeper, you see that, you know, for example, right now, <clears throat> the natural evolution, political, say, political evolution on our planet is suicidal. Oh, absolutely. You know, we're, we're, we're just, we're wrecking everything. Absolutely true right there, yes. <laughs> and so if we actually have loving divine parents, uh, you know, they, they would notice this and they would do everything they could to, to help us, but they don't want to make us dependent either. And that's the other side of the coin, which is when there's off-planet help, it's, you know, they're very um, cautious about it too. Uh, you know, they can, they're bold and they, and they do it suddenly, but they're also very measured in, a, in a, because if, if it's done too, uh, in a too dramatic way, it could, you know, blind the people. It could turn them into fanatics or into, into they could rebel against it. Uh, so it has to, it is, is a lot of wisdom that has to come to bear. And that's what we see in these, in these great events that are narrated in the ranch book, in particular, of course, the incarnation of Jesus, which is, um, you know, compared to other planets, there's nothing like that, uh, that occurs. They have, they have avatars like that, but they don't have, uh, they don't have a, an off-planet being of the order of, of Christ. Uh, it's, it's extremely rare, and they, uh, by the way, they don't have uh, an avatar who gets killed either. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> you know, they, it just none of these things happen on a norm. And just imagine uh, the other planets. You can imagine uh, planets have someone like Christ incarnating, and they kill them. I mean, that's just got to be aberrational. 
Oh, absolutely. I would I would agree with that 100 percent. You know, that's interesting that you bring that up, because uh, tonight um, in the news section of the show, I went into how uh, as of tonight, we have a, a special conjunction that's taking place between uh, Jupiter and Venus and that it's the first time in 2000 years that it's happened. And they uh, think that it's actually what was the star of Bethlehem. Uh, during that time period. So rather interesting that you bring that up. Um, why don't we get into that a little bit? Because I know that a lot of people are are uh, curious on that point alone. The papers on the in, in the Urantia book, they go really heavily into detail as far as the um, the truth of the origins of the Christ and all of the things that are associated with him and how we've kind of um, uh, taking a way different path with things, I guess you could say. Um, why don't we go ahead and get into that? What uh, what do the papers say about the origins of him and and uh, that that sort of thing? Well, first I just I, I just want to tell you how grateful I am that you know, that you're doing the interview because um, you have read these papers and it makes it much easier to do to do <laughs> to talk about it. So anyway, yeah. So you know the. Really, the, the most important thing for people to know about the Rancher book is that it presents, it purports to have the the angelic record of the life and teachings of Jesus. Um, and uh, not only does it provide this sort of almost like day by day uh, uh, narration that goes on for over 700 pages, but it tells you what he actually is in 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 the universe and what is his status in the universe, which was. Uh, as you know, I wrote, this was uh, an, uh, an issue of great uh, controversy in the early Christian centuries. Who who was this guy? Was he, you know, the second person of the divine trinity, or was he just a human, or was he kind of something in between, or, or was he even just even alive, or uh, an allegory, and uh, you know, getting into the Gnostic texts and all of that? There was so much debate that was going on during that time period. And certainly now too, and you know, you have we have entire religions. You know, Islam, for example, you know, says he was just a prophet. He was not an incarnate, you know, deity. And uh, you know, there's just you know, New Age people don't think he was just a great guy. And you know, Buddhism kind of ignores him. You know, so it's it's really a kind of up for grabs. And uh, but the <laughs> Rancher book gives you the most coherent picture uh, I've ever seen, and I've spent, you know, I've actually studied theology in a seminary, and I've looked and looked and haven't seen anything quite like this, and it, it basically states that, you know, the universe is a lot bigger than you think, and, um, you know, you, you have you have trillions of inhabited planets, um, and, you know, galaxy, entire galaxies are inhabited. They have, you know, billions of planets on them. And so uh, to have a high being um, overseeing all of that, you know, say, you know, trillions of inhabited planets is kind of a kind of a tough administration job. <laughs> so what they do, what what the great God does is is delegate uh, authority and uh, and he uh, distributes authority uh, to local um if you will, local universes. And uh, so what we have with Jesus, with Christ, is he is the chief being uh, and uh, and deity for the local universe, and a local universe is defined as up to 10 million inhabited planets. And, you know, it's like, well, only 10 million inhabited planets? That's all. <laughs> but, you know, it's... Uh, there's there's trillions of them according to the Rancher book, and that fits what we know about what we now know about uh, as, astronomy. We, but you know, when the Rancher book was written, they didn't even know that there was more than one galaxy. Yeah, so I it's take kind a... of astounding that this book from the 1930s and 40s, you know, told us that there were hundreds of millions of galaxies. I take a and, look at uh, the gave uh... you this <clears throat> this picture of a, of an administration of a local universe. So he's the local universe. Uh, Son of God, and um, one of the most remarkable things about that is that it's not just him alone, but there's a female uh, counterpart to him. Not not Virgin Mary, not his mother of <laughs> Mary, but a, a female uh, consort 
known as uh, Mother Spirit and as what people think of as the Divine Mother or, you know, the Divine Feminine. And so she is co-equal deity with with Christ. In the and uh, so Gnostic text. the head of our local universe is a divine couple. Uh, we know of him as Christ Michael, and she is known as Mother Spirit. She has other names. And so this Christ Michael is is the person who incarnated on Urantia, according to the Urantia book. I know in the uh, Gnostic text, it refers to the uh, feminine as the uh, Sophia, just as an example as well for another name that they give for this, uh, this feminine spirit. Um, for, the, for a great example of what you were discussing there about the local um, universe, you can take, for example, the Hubble te- telescope uh, image that they did, uh, just a, a small portion of a black spot um, in the sky, they f- they focused the Hubble telescope on, and they thought that there was nothing there at all. But they left it running for, I believe it was up to 30 days, if I remember correctly. By the time that they got everything developed and figured out with it, just within this little small portion of the um, night sky that was considered to be dark and nothing there, they found thousands upon thousands of galaxies that were there just in the background radiation. And uh, so, I mean, that's just one example of, of how vast our universe really, really is and how much space there really is. You know, I've always found that concept amazing. So when you were talking there, you know, I can definitely see how um, this being could, uh, you know, accomplish being in charge, I guess, of, of, you know, up to 10 million inhabited worlds, that'd be easily accomplished just even within that small portion of the night sky. Yeah. That, I mean, I don't know about easily, but <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> you know, but you, you, we're thinking, we're, we're speaking of beings who are incomprehensibly, you know, uh, omniscient, uh, you know, omnipresent, uh, all loving, they truly are God, but to the local uh, group of inhabited planets. So you know, we 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 think of God the Father, God the Mother, as as the the original source, first source of, of all things, and as 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 you know, of being far of transcendent and far above all things, but also imminent inside of all things at the same time and um, incomprehensibly great. Uh, but we, we can think also of Christ Michael and Mother Spirit as you know, nearly, you know, really uh, participating in that same uh, divinity, but they do not have the absoluteness and the infinity of the first source of, of God the Father. They are uh, they're not eternal beings, for example, uh, whereas uh, the Father and, and, and the eternal beings are eternal. And uh, we might mention, Ira, that uh, there is the evolutionary universes of billions of galaxies. They're evolving and growing. Uh, but according to the Rancher book, there's a central universe which is not growing and is not evolving. It's, it's, all, it's always existed from eternity, and it has... Um, perfect beings, eternal beings that live there, and it's very, very, very huge and large. And so uh, I think that this way, that from this eternal universe, the central universe, also known as like the mother universe, out of it comes beings who are sent here, uh, out here in space and time, you know, for a big fun project, (laughs) which is to uh, deal with evolving beings. So uh, someone like Christ or the Mother, Mother Spirit, are beings who were created for that purpose at a finite point in time, uh, a very, very long time ago, and, uh, and, but were, were given and delegated many of the divine powers of the first source of God. So, you know, that's kind of a long-winded reply. 
We have two questions as far as clarification from our chat room is concerned, um, just to make sure of what you're referring to. And I have an understanding, but just to make sure that they have the understanding of it. Um, when you're referring to Christ Michael, basically you're referring to the fact that the Archangel Michael that we refer to as the Archangel Michael is the Christ. Um, and also that the uh, central universe that you're speaking about, is that what would be considered to be heaven? Yeah, first, well, I'll take the second question first, uh, that this is the center universe is, you might say, the highest heaven, <clears throat> or the seventh heaven, so to speak. Um, but there are many uh, uh, layers uh, uh, in the heavenly realms of higher worlds, and then high, even higher, and then higher, higher dimensional worlds. So the um, center universe is beyond any possible description of a high heaven and really only in the ranch book is there any description that's even close to this description and that is one of the most stupendous things you could ever read is what is the central universe like it's really 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 fun reading oh and now i forgot the first question ira what was it, it was, uh, about, it was yeah, about archangel michael right yeah. yeah is that is that who you're referring to as the uh, christ michael no, they, what the Nirantia book authors, um, the celestial authors, um, do is they take particular names that we have from the Bible and other sources like that, mythical sources, and they re, uh, redefine them. And so they took this uh, name, Michael. Um, you know, in Christianity, there's a couple of major archangels, you know, Christ, uh, I mean, uh, sorry, Michael, uh, Gabriel's another one. Uh, and the Rancho book kind of picked, handpicked those names and gave them new identities. Uh, so Michael, the archangel, is the one that, you know, in, in sort of in the Bible and also in, uh, in Milton's Paradise Lost, is the one who fights, uh, who, who battles against Satan and Lucifer. And that really is one of the functions of Christ, of, Jesus, of, of Christ, according to the Rancho book. So they, they redefine that name as Michael. Uh, but there actually is a real Archangel Michael uh, also uh, that is not, uh, I don't believe is actually mentioned in the Arantia book, but we have transmissions from Archangel Michael through, uh, through certain channels who are Arantia-oriented channels. So there really is also a, such an Archangel Michael. And by the way, the, the Archangel Gabriel um, in the Arantia book is... Um, redefined as a very high being in the local universe. He's actually the first child, so to speak, of Michael and mother. I believe he's the very first being that they create. They sort of create offspring by fiat who have very high powers. And Gabriel was like, you know, think of him as the CEO of the local universe. <laughs> Is a big job, and uh, Michael and Mother are sort of like the chair, the chairpersons of the board, so to speak, and they're the creator beings who love us and minister to us. But Gabriel, who was once Archangel Gabriel, is actually the um, chief administrator of of the universe, and he's spoken many, 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 many times in transmissions around the world to Urantia people. That's pretty fascinating. One of the uh, people in the chat room also uh, clarified, I believe he said uh, it's Michael of Nebadon that was referred to in the um, in the Urantia book as being the Christ Michael. Yeah, correct. So the name of the local universe is Nebadon. And, you know, it's like, who, who, who could make up a name like that? But anyway, that's the name of it. And so he's known, uh, his, his title is uh, Michael of Nebadon. He's got many titles. <clears throat> and uh, that's one of his titles, Michael of Nebadon, and and the the mother, divine mother, the mother spirit has also an, another name, which is Nebadonia. You know, they took the name of the local universe and turned it into her name, Nebadonia, and uh, that's uh, she's she has that name because the whole expanse of the local universe is her. It's actually her body, and she, you know, she is a person, uh, a self-aware 
deity, but she also has an extent of her body, which is uh, just imagine it as this huge sphere that has, you know, billions of suns and millions of planets. That That's her body. So she's actually totally present in all space. So she she's uh, she's listening to us right now. In fact, <laughs> <laughs> hello. <laughs> wave, she, wave your hand. <laughs> hopefully, she finds the topic fascinating as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure she does. She likes she likes when we acknowledge her her her, her reality. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, one thing that I've thought over the years, as far as uh, like how things work, and I wonder how much this fits into the Urantia idea, um, is as we go through like different processes of evolving consciously, we go through different steps so we can start off from uh, the baseline of things. We understand what it's like to be an atom, you know, consciously. Then we can move up and, and uh, become like single celled organisms. And we understand what it's there, you know, experience all the things that are uh, possible to experience there and move up and up and up until you get to like the higher sentient creatures like us as human beings or those that might be on other planets. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then you can move up as well from there and become like the consciousness of a planet and move up from there and become the consciousness of a, a solar system and so on and so forth. And so maybe these beings that are referred to in the Urantia books, uh, you know, in the Urantia papers um, are actually ones that have gone through this kind of a process before. Is that something that is possibly uh, valid? Uh, so let's say so. I will, let's take an example. You mean say, for example, uh, Nebadonia or Mother Spirit? That'd be one example. Evolved right. through those stages. Is that is right? That what you mean? Right, and has gone through all the process of being the 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 underlings first, as you know, going through the process of of evolution that way, uh, up until the point where she has now become this. Yeah, that, that that's a that's a great and very pregnant question, so to speak. Um, yeah, I mean, it's one of the great messages of the Urantia book is is that evolution is um, is actually a divine process, and it is contained within divine beings, actually, within, within their consciousness, so that uh, we can think of it this way, that the, the, the creators of, of our local universe, or any local universe, they start out with nothing. They... Uh, as I mentioned previously, they they come out from the central universe. They're actually created again, sort of by fiat, uh, and they uh, as divine beings, and they come and they're kind of, you know, sent. I don't know how they get here, but they sent they're sent out to a kind of empty space, um, and working with sp special beings, they induce the creation of a great big nebula. And out of this nebula, suns uh, cool and are spun off. And of course, from the suns come planets. So they are actually deeply, intimately involved at every level with, with physical creation. So you can say, in a sense, they're kind of incarnated in, in it. They, they are particularly the uh, divine mother is um, is in it uh, as her body evolving, so to speak. But the way they put it is that they have a kind of differentiation of, of function that she is more in charge of matter and life, and he is in charge of the patterns of of matter and life. He's sort of like the master pattern maker, but she's the one that actually, you know, sort of uh, is, is making it all cook, <laughs> so to speak. Um, and so they, working together as one, they are, yes, I think this is, again, a very good question. They, they're really in it and of it. Uh, but, you know, of course, it's, it's, they allow complexity to evolve out of it that it, when I say complex, it's just what you were talking about. It starts as you know, single cell, you know, atoms, and even pre, pre atomic and quantum level, they start from there, and they induce it to uh, evolve. So, in uh, in short answer, yes, uh, they have 
you might say, submitted themselves to all levels of consciousness uh, and uh, are, that, in fact, is their job. And the much, much higher levels of consciousness that we're not even anywhere close to, they also are in charge. And so, you know, they have planets in the local universe that are billions of years, you know, they're billions of years old, way, 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 way ahead of us. Uh, we're a young planet. So they are working with, you know, unbelievably advanced beings on their oldest planet. So they, they, they can contain, they hold the space for that too. I think as well, there are a lot of planets that are out there that have never encountered the things like we've encountered here, where, uh, for instance, we've developed civilizations. We've gone, you know, from the Stone Age up and we keep getting devastated and thrown back into the Stone Age. So there are planets that are out there that may have never experienced this kind of thing. And so their society or their civilization is is way older than ours, for example, just by the benefit of them not having gone through these different different cataclysms that we've gone through. Right. So, you know, throughout the universe, there, there are, you know, millions, billions of planets that are, you know, completely, uh, you know, uh, sort of enlightened and um, have, uh, are, are in space, are traveling, uh, are moving around, um, have lifespans of maybe thousands of years, uh, have, uh, you know, gr incredible civilizations where everybody is sort of like everybody's like uh, you know like Gandhi and Mother Teresa, you know they're all like saints, uh, and and that's because they've had a normal spiritual evolution, and you know didn't blow themselves back to the Stone Age like we are about to do. And Definitely. you know for for you know for those of of, of us interested in uh, UFOs and ufology, you know it makes you know your ranch book makes it much easier to understand um, how it is that we're being visited, who these beings off planet are, the, ex the material extraterrestrials, who they are. The Ranch Book has this uh, wonderful section of a couple of chapters, papers, about life on other planets, and it gives you an awful lot of detail about that. So, you know, when I go to these UFO events, um, I, I try to share what the Ranch Book says, and people are eager to know what it says about life on other planets, because it's coming from a higher source than, than you know, purportedly than most other sources. It's definitely fascinating to me. We need to catch a break here real quick. Um, when we come back, I have a couple other questions that have come in from the chat room. And I also wanted to get into the topic of uh, something else that I find really fascinating. And that is the subject of uh, our human history here as explained by the Arantia papers. Um, I'm going to, uh, you're going to hear the music and everything, but I'll, uh, I'll put you on hold here real quick. And, um, when we come back, we'll get into that. Stick around with us guys. You guys are listening to late night in the Midlands. My name is Ira Robinson and uh, Michael Vera will be back with you. Hopefully tomorrow after the weather clears in his area. Uh, we will be right back after these messages. <laughs> The Late Night in the Midlands Radio Network is deeply devoted to you, the listener. We feel it is necessary to bring you all of the information that you can use in your life. Each and every day you will find something to listen to here. And whether you come away from the shows informed, inspired, or entertained, it is our passion. We don't bow to corporations and we don't have handlers to tell us what not to talk about. We bring you everything. Late Night in the Midlands, however, is fully listener-supported. We need your help to stay on the air and to make sure that we get the bills paid. We need your help to keep the truth alive. If you feel that you have gotten anything out of Late Night in the Midlands, we would appreciate your support. You can become a subscriber and help us out on a monthly basis, or if you'd like, a one-time donation is fully appreciated as well. Every year, 
the average household in America spends over $3,000 on entertainment alone. If you could help us with just a tiny fraction of that amount, you would make all of the difference. Go to LateNightInTheMidlands.com and click on the subscribe button. Thank you, and as always, keep yourself informed. Hello, this is Dick Farrell, here to tell you about OxySilver. Legally available only through CureShop.com and HealthyWorldStore.com. Don't be fooled buying silver products from copycats and criminals. You've heard Dr. Leonard Horowitz and experts urge you to avoid deadly vaccinations and illegal operators selling stolen OxySilver and OxySilver copycats. You've heard experts tell you about suppression in alternative medicine and confusing propaganda in healthcare and the truth movement. Read Dr. Horowitz's book, Healing Celebrations, to learn how miracle healings can be made to happen through faith, prayer, and a pure diet. Get great immunity using vitamin C, D, and OxySilver, Liquid Dentist, GI Flora Pro, a top-shelf probiotic. Use Green Harvest as a great-tasting meal substitute for energizing organic nutrients and losing weight. And Zeola, and natural clays for detoxifying your body. More advice, all these products and more are available from thecureshop.com including Oxy Silver, the world's most powerful silver hydrosol. Electro energized to put risky injections, toxic antibiotics, and deadly drug pushers out of business. Oxy Silver is covalently bonded to water. Unlike any other silver product using the frequency of chlorophyll 528, what Dr. Horowitz explains is pure tone love, the universal healer. NASA originally developed covalently body silver hydrosols to keep astronauts healthy in space. Dr. Horowitz added the 528 frequency to NASA's formula and more. Oxy Silver works three ways to electrocute dangerous germs better than anything, far better than all leading silver products and without any risk. Oxy Silver oxygenates and resonates with 528 for faster healing. So help save lives putting drug lords and criminals out of business and keep the LNM network broadcasting. Register for our free cooperative at healthworldaffiliates.com forward slash 4948. That's healthyworldaffiliates.com forward slash 4948. And buy Oxy Silver and other great products in package specials at great discounts from the cureshop.com buy oxy silver gi flora pro green harvest zeolove and love minerals at great discounts at cureshop.com that's cureshop.com with two p's c-u-r-e-s-h-o-p-p-e.com or call toll free at 1-888-621-7611 that's 1-888-621-7611 do it now Open Eyes is dedicated to finding the truth in all matters. We are not afraid to be politically incorrect or to ask questions. Whether it is the paranormal, government cover-ups, the dark agenda that the puppet masters have in store for us, or aliens and UFOs, nothing remains hidden. Listen to Open Eyes, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, starting at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, on LateNightInTheMidlands.com or OpenEyesNetwork.com. Open hearts, open minds, open eyes.
Welcome back once again to Late Night in the Midlands. My name is Ira Robinson, and uh, once again, as I said before the break, Michael Vera is uh, off tonight, uh, not intentionally. His uh, weather in his area is uh, terra bad, and uh, so he lost internet connection for a while and uh, asked me if I could go ahead and step into his place tonight. Some pretty big shoes to fill, but hopefully I'm doing an okay job for you guys. Tonight we are speaking to Byron Belitsos, and I'm having a great time with this conversation, and uh, hopefully he is as well. Uh, Byron, we are back, and we have a couple of uh, questions that came in from the chat room, if you don't mind hitting them real quick. All right, let's go for it. Okay, so the uh, the first one is, um, would you be able to uh, perhaps break down a little bit the uh, hierarchy of angels that's given in the Urantia book? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a big subject uh, because it's such a big universe, but... Uh, we can say it is a hierarchy. Uh, I like to think of it as uh, uh, what you might call a holarchy. <laughs> that is, you know, they're they're not uh, oppressive hierarchy, <laughs> holistic hierarchy, and they're a loving uh, hierarchy. And uh, you know, of course, it starts from from the highest heaven, as we mentioned before. These are eternal beings who, you know, they're super super angels. Uh, they um, have origin f- from eternity, which uh, which is they're not uh, they have no birth. <clears throat> so uh, these are eternal beings. You can call them the Eternals. And at the heart of all of that is is the uh, is uh, in your ranch book they use the term father, but they mean father mother. So the, the then they call this uh, being the first source and center and. Um, then there's uh it's important to to make clear to folks that that this is a trinitarian picture so there's um a son uh, that the 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 father uh is uh, gives birth to but of course the son is eternal so there's no there's actually no origin but the son is is um equal in every way to the father but has some different functions and then there's a third person in the divine trinity who is uh, known by various names but we could call this this the spirit father son spirit just like in christian doctrine and f- stemming from them are different types of beings <clears throat> there are beings that are what they call trinity origin angels angels that are created by all three of them um and uh th- those are sort of the highest beings in the universe they they're of origin from the three great deities of the universe. So think of it as, as Trinity origin angels. And then there be uh, angels, uh, uh, many, many, many orders who are of origin from the Father and the Son or from the Father and the Spirit or from the Son and the Spirit. So they're in the various permutations. And, for example, Christ Michael is, you know, in a sense, an angel, an angel because it's created being um, and but of course he's he's a, he's really more of a deity but he he stems directly from the father and the son but not from this not from the third person and the divine mother uh, mother spirit who is his consort his wife so to speak she stems directly from the third person of the trinity uh, who is the, uh, the the god the spirit so you can see that uh, they have different permutations and they can create beings from from them. And as we mentioned, um, in the local universe, there are orders of angels uh, that descend from uh, from Michael and Mother. And uh, they, they can be created by fiat from her or by fiat from him or from them, the two together, such as <clears throat> Gabriel is from the two together. And uh, but the the mother's uh, mother spirit creates most of of the, of the orders of angels directly from herself, uh, such as the seraphim, which are uh, the uh, angels that are that are ministering directly to human beings. And then under even under them, there's uh, angels who are sort of le- uh, less powerful, known as cherubim and sanabim, cherubim and sanabim. And they sort of work under uh, seraphim, and everybody uh, has a guardian seraphim. All of us do, and uh, but uh, very few of us have 
a dedicated guardian seraphim. Um, they tend to work. They're, you know, very brilliant beings. They can they can supervise a hundred of us at the same time, no problem. <clears throat> so the, the sort of the lowest end of of this of this uh, holarchy or hierarchy are beings that are important to know about, who are known as midwayer angels. And they are the angels that come the very closest to us. They are just out of our visible range. They have a sort of lower being, so to speak, than the seraphim and the cherubim. And uh, they're, they're kind of quasi-human, actually. And so from them come sort of the legends of, uh, of you know, sort of leprechauns and, and uh, uh, various kinds of beings that are kind of nature spirits. Uh, because they they really are inhabitant inhabitants of our planet, <clears throat> whereas angels uh, come and go here. Um, but uh, the the, the midwayer beings are the actually the only residential angels that stay here ba- almost forever. Uh, and I, I want to add, uh, although it's on a slightly different subject, that the midwayer angels, who are the residents of of Urantia, planet Earth are the origin of the 1111 phenomenon. So the 1111 time prompt is is it's that's their that's their doing if you want to get into that at some point. Uh so in summary, <clears throat> you know, you have very high trinity origin beings that uh, that are uh you might say in in charge of galaxies. And then you have uh, many levels in between, many I haven't barely covered it. Uh, and the next important level is the local universe angelic host, you might say. And then there's the planetary uh, angels of various kinds. And and but the Rancher book has you know a couple hundred pages going into this is quite a quite a catalog of <laughs> angelology. Well, it's a it's a big bureaucracy, so it needs a lot of paperwork to cover it all, right? <laughs> well, it's funny you say that because uh, they actually keep records. And uh, it's a really important function um, of of angels is to record what's happening. And of course, they you know they you know that was kind of holograms or whatever they use, but they they have a, a record of all things. It's like an akashic record. And uh, when we um, graduate to the next life, uh, they have a record of our deeds and doings. <laughs> down here and it's it's presented to us in our life review uh but that's just one of many uh, you know dozens of of jobs of angels but yes it is you know it sounds bureaucratic when people come to the ranch they say, well that's just this big bureaucracy of angels why should i but actually you know when you actually read it it's it's delightful and charming to read about any one of these types of angels you just can't believe the detail and you know that nobody could ever make this up. It's just it's just amazing, just that section that's in part one and part two of the Rancher book. Well, I have a I have a sideline question then for you in regards to this because you touched on a couple of things that really um, cued me as far as this is concerned. Um, my wife Jolene is a person who experienced a near death experience, and during her experience, she was four years old when she had it. And uh, when she crossed over to the other side and was there, she knew that there was a being that was there, but she couldn't see it because it was behind a a veil of sorts. Um, But it spoke to her. And uh, while she was there, I mean, just kind of breaking down into a a 30 second synopsis here. But uh, uh, while she was there, she was basically given the opportunity to choose everything that would happen in her life and was shown... um, essentially laid out like a book that she could turn the pages and see exactly what would be occurring in her life, who she'd meet, who she'd have in her life. All of this stuff was basically laid out right before her. And she remembers all of it to this day. So with the things that you're referring to here, was it maybe one of this uh, order of angels that she was referring to or speaking to? And, uh, you know, maybe what, how does that relate? Did you did you say Ira that she actually was shown things that were to come in her life? Right? Yes, absolutely, including uh, me, for example. She was shown what I would look like, our life together, our children, the fact that they weren't oh. hers, but uh, you know what they looked like. Every bit of it basically was laid out right before her. Wow, that's 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 pretty remarkable. I've been studying uh, near death experiences. I don't think I've even heard of one that showed foretold the entire life of a person. Um, 
the um, you know the Urantia book is is ambiguous on the subject of foreknowledge. Um, it does it's, it definitely doesn't doesn't convey the idea that angels know everything we're going to do, who we're going to marry, and it definitely doesn't convey that at all. <clears throat> and it actually seems to imply that even you know God the Father doesn't know in detail everything that ha- that's going to happen. The, you know, he certainly has the big picture of you know the beginning, beginning and the end of things, but he gives us, he she gives us free will to literally choose these things right in the moment, and it's not foreknown and not predestined. So it's it's a kind of a uh, well, probably the most I think for me personally the most difficult philosophic and theological problem that comes out of the Arantia book is. How do we interpret that? Um, I don't have an answer, but we've had these supplemental transmissions that I, I've referred to since the Arantia book. And um, I don't know if you're aware, Ira, about that. Do you know about the uh, the so-called teaching mission and what that is? I've heard about it, but I've never actually looked into it, no. Um, I, I'm, I'm the primary publisher of books from, from that new material, and... Um, we can maybe talk about some of that later, but in that new material, which are transmitted to your ranch of students, literally channel. This is literal channeling. It's not trans channeling, but it's 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 uh, transmitted to them telepathically. They uh, people have asked questions about foreknowledge, and you know, do angels know what we're going to do and where we're going to go? You know, it's 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 not clearly. I haven't I haven't squared it yet. So. Anyway, so that, that's quite a remarkable uh, experience that, that Jolene, your wife, had. We do know, of course, that in, in near-death experiences, people see their past. <clears throat> and, um, you know, that's well established, you know, not just by the Rancher book, but in many sources, that there is an Akashic record of all things that have happened. And uh, But the Rancher book makes that a little bit more personal. It's, it states that they're personal beings that are doing this. It's not, it's not like the impersonal law of karma that's kind of recording everything. It's actual beings who are there loving you, nurturing you, and recording you. <laughs> <laughs> um, sort of like a, uh, a good version of the NSA, perhaps. <laughs> Hey, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Yeah, they, they really are listening in and uh, it's doing uh, benign surveillance. And, you know, of course, they they do intervene on occasion. Um, they have to be uh, sort of commanded by the by higher angels um, to do certain things, but now, they also have flexibility to take initiatives on their own. Okay, so and that's they, that's one question they, I was going to ask is is uh, when I was younger, when I was eight years old, I had an experience, and I wonder if this is uh, perhaps what you're referring to there. I had an experience where I was I was running across the street to go uh, to a park, and my family was standing outside talking, and a car was driving down the road very fast. I mean, it was it was zooming like crazy. And um, the car got very close to me and something, it was like, it was almost like this streak of nothingness is how I can refer to it, came out of nowhere and it, it literally flung me backwards into the, the waiting arms of my mom who was just getting ready to voice a scream because she saw that the car was coming. And uh, it was literally, it was like out of nowhere. I was not injured in any way, shape or form. It, it you know, the, the impact of this being hitting me didn't injure me at all, but it was like, I literally got picked up and flung, you know, a good 25 feet away from where this car was. So is that maybe an example of one of these angels basically coming to the rescue, for instance? You know, absolutely. I mean, it seems there are no doubt and there are witnesses to the you know, incredible experience that you had. And, you know, I've heard many of these cases too, because I keep my eyes open for them uh, because I have a certain personal affection for, the type of angel that does that, again, I mentioned uh, they're known as midwayer angels. They're, they're midwayers because they're midway between humans and seraphim. Uh, they're sort of, sort of midway, and that means that they are, are so close to us that they can physically do things, whereas uh, a seraphim cannot physically lift you and move you. But um, but these these angels called midwayers can do that. And they're the only angel that has physical hands-on contact with us. Uh, so I would, I would, 
I would surmise that a midwayer uh, came in and um, and saved you. And what we know about them and all uh, beings uh, of this sort is that they're they're basically outside of space and time, and and so they they can sort of see things. They can you know almost like in slow motion, and so they can act at the speed of light. <clears throat> so they can they can see a car is coming and can intervene in time. Doesn't mean they fore, foresee the future, but they see what's happening with tremendous, you know, granularity. They, and so, so I would guess it's, uh, it's our friends, the Midwayers, who saved you. That's a, what a great story that is. It was uh, definitely an experience to remember. It has uh, quote unquote impacted me <laughs> for the past 40 years. That's for sure. Um, well, you know, one question that I had then, uh, as far as this whole Urantia idea is concerned and the, the things that are within it, um, you could say that most uh, of the religions on the planet don't really get along too well with the Urantia papers, correct? Uh, they don't even know about it, really, because, um, you know, think of Buddhism or Islam or Hinduism, and, you know, it's, it's not been really disseminated uh, well. Uh, but as far as Christians, you know, some Christians do, some seminaries do. But uh, it's been it's a whole other story as to why the Rancher book has not been disseminated. It is not known by them uh, very well. It's it's kind of a scandal, really, that it's not known to them. Uh, so so far, the the great clash between the Rancher book and everybody else uh, has not come yet. Although we we believe that the the Vatican really does know about it, and it's it's rumored that uh, Pope Francis. Uh, had a you know had access to it, and in uh, where he came from in Argentina, he knew about study Urantia study groups because it's well known in uh, Latin America. It turns out so, uh, but you know obviously if if he thought it was important, he would uh, bring bring it to the world's attention. Well, you know, I wonder I, you know, maybe so if... like all the rest, you know, they buried it and they don't want to talk about it. And when I was in. Uh, theology school, um, you know, I had I had decent credentials to be in graduate school, but I could not find any professor that would work with me uh, on a dissertation on the Rancher book. So I actually left graduate school. I was a young man and wanted to do that, and uh, I couldn't find anybody to work with. <clears throat> they just had, number one, they hadn't heard of it, number two, when they looked at it, just didn't, they just couldn't deal with it. So in a way, this thing is far ahead of its time, and number one, number two, it has not had very good advocates out there yet. And uh, number three, I think it's been actively suppressed. I, I do, too. It, I, I think that as well myself. Um, you know, whenever I speak about it to anybody, they're like, what? I've, I've never heard of that. And I'm like, how could you have never heard of that? You follow the same circles that I do. How could you have never run across this in your past? You know, it's very, very confusing. Um, one question that came in from the chat in regards to this, and this might um, get us into the topic of, of us and our human history in regards to what these beings have said about Urantia. Um, has this information been revealed any time in the past, or is this like the first revelation that this has ever been? And uh, maybe how does that actually relate to uh, what we as human beings have gone through since our inception? Well, good. I'm glad we're getting to that. That's that's uh, really important for your listeners to know about sort of the prehistory teachings of the Urantia book, and that uh, things that, that I'm talking about have been uh, revealed in the past. However, the records are very garbled because of the uh, chaos uh, of our history. We don't have good records of these of these encounters, but we do have, for example, in the Bible, you know, the story, uh, you know, the really the whole all, all, the entire Prehistory that the Rancher book talks about is 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 contained in sort of mythic form in uh, in Genesis and other parts of the Bible, you know, going all the way back to uh, the first visitation half a million years ago. And if you like, we can get into that. That was uh, <clears throat> that was the initial um, divine intervention here. Um, that uh, is, you know, is the beginning of this story. But you know that the records of that are lost 
all, you know, pretty much entirely with 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 the exception of a few references to the Nephilim in the ranch, or I mean, in the Bible, and the Elohim, and and a few other terms like that, um, it, and the you know Tower of Babel and some other things. It's totally uh, you know sort of um, you know uh, garbled and convoluted. Um, so, but the, the the second great visitation, the story of Adam and Eve, is got a little bit more detail in the Bible and and also in the Quran and other places. Um, so that that is uh, known about in uh, mythic form. And then the third great epical event is almost completely unknown. It's the the uh, advent of a being uh, 2000 BC named uh, Melchizedek. Who initiated the line of uh, of the Hebrews, and of course we all know about Jesus. That's the fourth great revelation, and then the Ranch Book purports to be the fifth of these. So you know it's a very difficult story to tell. And when I get out and give talks on this, people are like kind of wide eyed because it's like all of this is so new to them. <laughs> For example, you know the ancient astronaut idea. Um. Which is pervade, you know, mainly out of Sitchin, Zechariah Sitchin. That has been put out there. That's well known, but that is, uh, in my view, uh, you know, a completely incorrect interpretation of the Sumerian tablets. Um, and the Rancho book, I think, has a much better story of prehistory than that. If you'd like to get into that, yeah, most certainly, I, I would love to. Um, the The subject of of us as human beings and our history is one that's always really fascinated me, and the fact that we've really been lied to all along about what it means to be human and uh, the origins of us, I think, is is such an important thing. If we don't understand our origins, we can't understand, you know, the who and what we are in this day and age. Um, that's just how I feel. And and uh, by the way, anybody that, that wants to call in, you're more than welcome to. We will take calls. It's uh, 260-494-3937. So uh, anyways, yes, most definitely, please get into what uh, what we have gone through. Yeah, I want to maybe contextualize it a little bit in relationship to uh, Sitchin, uh, because his work is so popular on, on this subject. And over the years, I've, I've, you know, begun to come to believe that Sitchin is um, may possibly be a disinformation agent uh, because the Urantia book has a similar timeline to his, saying uh, about half a million years ago these beings descended here and you know came here. Uh, with a with a particular project in mind, he has the same timeline half nine years ago, and in fact, he states they came down in the Persian Gulf area, uh, and so does the Rancha book. So that's very interesting. And uh, he also states that there was a rebellion uh, that occurred, a, a so-called slave rebellion that occurred about two hundred thousand years ago against the these you know these Anunnaki, right? And the ranch book states that there indeed was a rebellion about 200,000 years ago, but it's a whole different story. And what Sitchin states is that uh, the Anunnaki came here and uh, and eventually, you know, bred a slave race out of humans and uh, oppressed us and um, and you know the, the genetic experiments that were you know very questionable uh, experiments to create slaves and that sort of thing. And had this very mundane project on Earth, but you know, and so this is a picture of humans and our origin, which is very depressing. Uh, the the Rancha picture of our origin is is very exalted. It says, you know, we're, you know, sons and daughters of God. We're, we we participate in, in sonship and daughtership with with divine, and so we are loved. And so the beings who descended here half a billion years ago came out of love to uh, support our evolution. And uh, yes, they made they, they aborted the whole project. That's a whole other story. But, the, but, you know, just think about it this way, Ira, that, you know, wh- who you are, your identity has to do with where you're from and where you're going. And, and to me, there are dark forces that are trying to control our identity, where we're from and where we're going. 
and wouldn't they want to plant the idea that we're just a slave race that were created by a gene splice from an exploitative extraterrestrial race? What a you know what a terribly dismal picture of humanity. That <laughs> well, is. when I when I think of the the psychology that happens to a person when they have been raised, for instance, to think that they are an animal or to think that they're nothing, that's exactly how they act. That's exactly how they're going to turn out. Um, you know, the the origin of you, that baseline understanding of yourself, has a heavy influence on what you do and accomplish from that point forward. So if you're told that you are a race that has been enslaved in the past, you're going to think in terms like that. Your your whole the psychology of the race itself, you know, the psychology of the species is going to be um with that mindset in there, you know, with that in the genetic makeup almost of of who you are. So you're gonna act a lot more like that uh enslaved race as opposed to uh, if you were to be raised up thinking that you were amazing and wonderful and powerful and all this stuff. It's a, it's a vastly different way of thinking and it's a vastly different way that you're going to turn out as a person as well as a species. You know, and it's, it's amazing that, uh, that you can, you know, have, we can have a scenario in which this picture of humanity is dominant in the field of prehistory uh, studies, um, of course, it's not academic. It's outside of academia. They don't pay any attention to this. But uh, if you go to, you know, the Contact of the Desert, really the biggest UFO conference in the world, where I was last month, it's all about that. It's 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 all about, you know, we're a slave race, and the ancient astronauts came here and they exploited us and used us and. You know, there were some benign influences, but mainly, uh, you know, we're kind of nobodies and. And uh, we have to liberate ourselves, but it, what it creates is like, like a slave mentality that where you you have to be a rebel, you have to rise up and fight, you know. And and in a sense, they're right that you know we are oppressed, uh, but we have again this divine origin. And you know, your ancient book and other sources teach that we are indwelled by a a part of God, a spark of of the divine, of the pure divinity. And, uh, you know, we are destined to, uh, to greatness, as Jesus said. You, know, you shall do greater things than I did. And, and that's the message we need to get across. And so this history that we're talking about is essential for that. But, you know, that said, <clears throat> it, it is, there's some truth in this view as well, that because the Urantia book also tells us that we fell into a great oppression here. Um, because our immediate planetary supervisors went to the dark side, and that is the you know the kind of the the, the sort of the terrible secret of the Urantia book uh, that people don't seem to know uh, they don't read deeply into it, which is that this is uh, in a sense a prison planet, in that the our uh, immediate uh, angelic host. Most of it went went dark and followed Lucifer, and so we can get into that if you like. Sure, most definitely. Go ahead and uh, go ahead and, and get as much of that story out as you can, because again, this is this is important information to understand if you are uh, you know trying to understand why we are seeing the things that we're seeing today. It even relates to all of that in the prehistory. We've been carrying it in our in our very makeup ever since. Uh, yeah, so uh, let, let me let me also preface that Ira by saying that uh, what I'm talking about is is in videos you can find of mine on YouTube and also at my website evolving-souls.org. And there, uh, I, I had a, a, a conference recently where I introduced these ideas and other speakers did in some depth with slides and charts and everything. And there are other tools at my website <clears throat> that people can get more background. Of course, you can get the ranch book itself. <laughs> um, uh, so um, the, this first great visitation to our planet is what happens on any planet when evolution, natural evolution, as I said earlier, uh, when natural evolution reaches its highest point that it can. We're talking about biological, 
genetic and cultural consciousness evolution comes a long way, a very long way over a couple of billion years, you know, to the to the to the hominid level, and then from hominids you have real human beings, primitive human beings, who then uh, immediately are indwelt by uh, divine uh, forces. They, they literally their minds re- receive an augmentation once they are sort of defined as humans. And so what we think of as human is is what evolved by a million years ago and had these endowments of free will and, and, and rationality. They just didn't have technology and they hadn't evolved. So they evolved for about a half a million years according to your rancher account. And so a half a million years ago, so you were talking one million, a span of one million years, so a half a million years ago was a great and grand visitation, the first great visitation of 100 avatar beings who were specially selected from higher worlds and who, for whom bodies were constructed. And they then sort of materialized uh, on a, a location near the present-day Persian Gulf with a charter, with a program of building a capital city for the whole planet. So again, Sitchin says that this visitation occurred in the Persian Gulf. Well, this says it too. But this was actually, uh, according to your answer book, is beings who come here with a curriculum to teach us and help us. And, you know, back then, of course, you know, the primitive indigenous humans didn't have much. They, for example, they had hundreds and hundreds of languages. They didn't have writing. They didn't have math. They didn't have uh, lots of tools. They didn't know about plumbing. They didn't know about animal husbandry. They didn't know much about health. And so the, the, this this group of 100 avatars, 50, 50 men, 50 women, uh, were had this uh, this training from a higher world to incarnate and and create this city, and then invite in the the tribes from around the area who would be trained and then sent out like emissaries. So this great uh, capital city was called Dalamatia. And Dalamatia was uh, was uh, built up over several hundred thousand years. And they had not just these avatars, but they were overseen by uh, unseen, invisible beings who were kind of in charge. So the, the avatars are not exactly in charge. They're on the ground, but their superiors are invisible. They're angelic. And so in the angelic host of the planet were led by uh, the uh, what we call the resident governor general, really kind of the chief general manager of the planet. And this being is, is a being named Caligastia. So, you know, this is an intricate story, and, you know, <laughs> again, you can get more on my website or your ranch book itself, but uh, what is important to know is that uh, the so-called devil, according to Christian myth, turns out to be this being, Caligastia, who went to the dark side, which can happen, happens in about one in a million planets, and swung with him his administration and influenced all the humans on the ground and the avatars on the ground. And so this was a rebellion known as the Lucifer Rebellion. The Lucifer Rebellion is one of the three or four major teachings of the Urantia book that people need to know uh, because th- this was the influence of a, of a high angel named Lucifer, his lieutenant named Satan, who went to planets in the local uh, the local group and influenced them to go into rebellion against the universe government. I know it sounds like uh, science fiction. <laughs> uh, I'm going to stop there for a moment, uh, Ira, and, 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 and let you ask questions because it's a lot to take in. Um, well, so far, so good. Uh, everybody is is understanding it, I believe. Um, we haven't had anybody kind of going, wait, what? You know, that kind of thing. But um, I guess one thing that I would say is um, 
with relation to this event, you said that it was like one in a million planets. I guess you could say that we were the uh, the lucky, quote unquote, ones to get hit with this kind of thing. Um, but one question that I would have, and I don't I don't remember for sure if it goes into this in Urantia or not. Um, but uh, is it the case where when something like this occurs, that it is actually in the end beneficial for the the uh, the uh, sentient species that is there uh, because of the the fact that we would have to to fight harder, learn better, you know, learn the lessons more, I guess you could say, uh, so that in the end it's actually a little bit more beneficial to to um, have to fight for our divinity as opposed to just you know giving giving it. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. A wonderful point, Ira. Um, Ira, I'm going to I'm going to simply pick up a different phone. Are you there? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to pick up a different phone. This phone, uh, I thought the battery would go a little bit longer, but I'm going to pick up the main phone here and so put you down and pick up the other phone. Oh, okay, no problem. <laughs> Second. Ira, you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay, I'll shut that over phone off. Uh, still hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So um, the. The great thing about this story is that when you have an adversity of this kind as, as, a, as a human race, you are a, a special, special category in, in, the, in the universe. And uh, those who come from what they call rebellion planets are very precious persons in, 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 the, in the greater universe because you've had all of this, these challenges that people on normal planets don't have. You might think of them as, you know, sort of bourgeois, <laughs> living, living in the suburbs, and they have life easy. But we're like, you know, we're like in the inner city where everybody's shooting at one another. And, and so you, you, you begin, you know, we're more streetwise, so to speak, and we have to develop discernment skills, you know, somewhat beyond people from normal planets. So then in the, in the, in the higher worlds, in the afterlife, we're a pretty special uh, uh, breed, and we're given uh, uh, more advanced assignments because we have learned to have faith uh, in the midst of uh, chaos, uh, whereas they, they had visible avatar beings on their planet throughout their history. We have not. They had benign, angelic hierarchy on their planet. We have not. And and so you know we're we're the tough guys, um, and um, so it's 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 a great it's a great point. And you know in in the in the far distant future, people coming from our planet get a special title um, that uh, they 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 are they are the the sort of the those who have overcome the most. And so you know we should not despair about coming from a rebellion planet. Uh, we should, uh, in a way, celebrate. It's ironic, but we can celebrate that fact and have a positive frame framing of of this of this problem, especially now because you know we it's we've evolved through hellacious conditions to a relatively you know high high civilization compared to you know even a hundred years ago. Uh, yes, we're warlike. Yes, we have diseases. You know, yes, we're you know primitive compared to extraterrestrials. But now we can really rise above this and look at it. And that, that's one reason the Ranch book came in this period, because we're ready to you know hear the whole story. Yeah, so I a think big that part of the whole story is the Lucifer Rebellion. I think that one of the one of the ways that I look at things is that we, as a species, we've evolved really far as far as the physical things are concerned. But at this point in time, we really do need to evolve a lot more spiritually. Um, to be able to progress forward, I guess you could say. You know, we've 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 become kind of unbalanced in that way. We we are, uh, you know, without a doubt, there are so many aberrations <clears throat> that there is not a holistic kind of evolution. You know, this we've we're, we're really good in some areas and we're terrible in other areas. You know, particularly, you know, we're very good in technology and science, and we're far ahead in those areas um, if we compare it to our ethical and our moral development it's 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 kind of it's far behind and the, you know on a normal planet all of these things would evolve um, together as a, as a whole uh, evolution so we we have this bizarre patchwork of of uh, aberrations 
you know, we have, you know, completely primitive Stone Age people living on this planet, and then we have people who are, you know, really advanced, uh, almost, you know, like avatars. You know, we have, have the complete expanse. <clears throat> and how are you gonna how are you gonna weave all of that together? You know, and you know, it's really my view looking at this is that there's a, there's really only way to put it all together, and that's with another great intervention. And so. Uh, we, I haven't mentioned it, but it's it's the view of many of uh, Urantia students, particularly more esoteric Urantia students, that there's going to be um, a uh, a new uh, avatar appearance here that uh, is uh, actually been announced uh, in a variety of venues. It's called the Magisterial Mission, <clears throat> where there will be a divine son, a divine being, so to speak, uh, from the uh, mother universe, from the central universe, is, uh, we're told, will incarnate in our lifetimes uh, to weave all of this together, because it's really beyond uh, what any human could do. Is that what's sometimes referred to as the uh, the Maitreya, I think is the word, Maitreya? Yeah, it's really, really this, roughly the same idea. Okay. So it's not the second coming of, of Jesus, which is also discussed in the Rancho book, but it's this, it's a like a second coming of a being of the order uh, related to Jesus, but this is a being whose job is not a creator, he's not a creator, he's not our creator, but he's more as a judge, but he's a benign judge, he's a merciful presence. And, you know, the creator, Michael, Jesus, Christ Michael and, and Mother, they can't be the judge of their own children. That has to be another personality uh, who has uh, a different uh, perspective. So this Maitreya being, if you will, <clears throat> is a, a magistrate. It's like a divine magistrate. So he will terminate this era, and and he will uh, he will sort of put things in in their right place uh, because he has you know pr- basically perfect discernment. Uh, of of what's going on, <clears throat> we've had a number of uh, interactions with him through channels, and I have uh, published a book called uh, "Healing a Broken World." It came out a few years ago, which is uh, some of his statements uh, as, as to what his program is, and uh, you know, various channels have uh, slightly different versions, uh, but it, we we all have been told he's present and he is soon to incarnate here uh, to take the reins so to speak gotcha i understand yep okay so um with relation to the past then one one question that i would have that uh comes to my mind is um since we're on this rebellion planet uh i guess do other Rebellion planets also have this uh, this imbalance towards the physical, or are there some rebellion planets that perhaps have more of, a, of an imbalance towards the spiritual? You know, have they gone in the other direction as far as that's concerned, or is it more that um, these divine beings, I guess, become so fascinated with the physical that they they uh, push it as much as they can? Great question. Uh... I don't think I mentioned that uh, we're told that there were 37 rebellion planets. Uh, we're one of 37 rebellion planets in the local group of, plan- of inhabited planets that chose to follow Lucifer. Now, the, in, in the local group of planets that he was the head of, there were uh, uh, over 600 inhabited planets, so uh, only 5% of them went rebel. And so on these, we have uh, just a little bit of information about these rebel rebellion planets. Um, we have a whole chapter in the Arantia book on one of them, actually. And it, it's it's just as chaotic and just as uneven as as this planet. It, it's uh, each one has got its own mess, <laughs> and uh, they uh, they're all uneven. I don't think there's any cases where. Where they're very hyper spiritual, <laughs> uh, I think it's mainly that they they're just warlike, and, and because you know it's sort of like if your parents were uh, were fighting all the time and were and were were pathological, then the children will become warlike and pathological. 
so the planet itself is, is, is a mess. And so each of these planets have received very special ministry from off-planet beings. Uh, we don't know much about it. We do know that none of them had Christ incarnating there. Only we did. Uh, he came to basically the worst of the 37. <laughs> <laughs> I was just about ready to ask what made us special. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's, it's, it says here and there, you know, there's some one or two places that are worse than this, but basically we, were, we just really had complete pandemonium. And so, you know, being this high, loving, and merciful creator being, he, of course, would choose the, the, the worst uh, to minister to, uh, you know, just like he, he, you know, he commanded us to, you know, minister to the least of us. If you minister to the least of us, you, you you know you're serving me. So of course he's doing it too. He came to a place that you know was so such a mess, such a dark place that they killed him. <clears throat> and um, you know probably wasn't in the original plan, but you know he was subject to human will. And um, but he incarnated here as an example to all all planets in his local universe, but especially as a teaching to the rebellion planets, because now they have the story of their creator who came and took on the appearance of human and made himself subject to, to, you know, to the vicissitudes of the human life. And, you know, what greater story of love and mercy can you think of? <clears throat> and so, but beyond that, there, there, there are minor revelations about life on these planets in the, uh, in the new transmissions that I mentioned, known as the teaching mission. And by the way, if people want to look that up, the uh, archives of these transmissions is called TM Archives. TM, as it stands for teaching mission, tmarchives.com. <clears throat> and also another one called Daniel, D-A-Y-N-A-L dot org. These are two sites that have these transcripts that run into 20,000 pages and you can go in there and search on keywords and and find you know the most amazing embellishments of of the teachings of the Urantia book. That is a uh, lot of information. <laughs> it's a lot. It's like you know I just I just recently turned sixty and I decided to you know spend the rest of my life you know trying to study this and bring it out. Well, uh, listen, Byron, we're going to go ahead and take uh, our last break here real quick, and uh, it'll be a short one. So uh, when we come back, let's get more into um, that topic as well as some other uh, things that have come up in the chat room as well as far as questions for you are concerned. Um, we will be right back, folks. Stick around. You are listening to Late Night in the Midlands. I am here with Brian Bellizzano. Or Be I'm sorry. I totally mispronounce your last name all the time. Belitzos, correct? Byron Belitzos. Belitzos. Okay, I, keep, I kept saying Belitzos, and I knew that wasn't quite correct. So, um, okay, so we will be, we will be right yeah, back, and uh, I promise I will stop butchering his name. <laughs> Stick around with us. We will be back in just a few minutes. So I'll admit it, I'm a geek. I love anything science fiction or fantasy. I love to collect things that are related to the things that I like. There's a place that I go to to find unique things. It's an Etsy shop that's called The Geeky Stitcher. They have some amazing and one-of-a-kind handcrafted collectibles on a lot of my favorite science fiction and fantasy related shows and movies. You know, geek stuff. <laughs> They have things like gloves that look just like the TARDIS from Doctor Who. They have crocheted figures from Star Trek, Disney movies, even Navi from The Legend of Zelda. They're all made with love, and they have a unique style, and best of all, they're cheaply priced. They'll even do custom orders. All you have to do is let them know what you would like to, to see made, and they'll get right on it. 
Check them out today at thegeekystitcher.etsy.com. Or you can also go to their Facebook fan page, which is found at The Geeky Stitcher. <laughs> go there today. I'm sure you guys will find something that you would really, really love. The l m Radio Network and Late Night in the Midlands depends on you, the listener. Without you, there would be no us. So help us continue to bring you the best guests with the best information and subscribe today. Information on becoming an l m subscriber can be found at the top of LateNightInTheMidlands.com. Just click the About Subscriptions tab and become part of the family while helping the truth stay alive. And while you're at it, maybe subscriptions aren't for you. A one-time donation helps as well. Click that donate button on the right side of LateNightInTheMidlands.com and help us help you. The rising rate of autism is not just concerning, it's a disaster. No matter what the cause of it is, it is something that everyone should be acutely aware of and actively helping out those in the community that have it. That is why Adventures in Autism was created. Adventures in Autism is a show inspired by our life with our son Seth and the many experiences his autism has brought to our lives. Each episode we bring you the topic of the week, news about autism, and resources to help you and your family or friends out in their own adventures with autism. Tune in Mondays at noon and midnight on lnmradionetwork.com or openeyesnetwork.com and get involved in the community. Let our experiences be an inspiration to you. I grew up seeing things a little differently Appearing, disappearing, hardly innocent nor tied down to the ground I learned to roll and tumble with the punches Glory in my stripes and spots walk by invisible And never make a sound But heavy is the crown that's always hidden Tender is the heart you never see Hard and fast shines the grin that we flash But there's a vulnerable stripe or two on me Maybe any place outside of Wonderland is not for me, my friend If I leave my grin behind, remind me that we're all mad here and it's okay Sun up, sun down, the shadows hide me down in Wonderland, Wonderland Nobody knows the way, but if you find it in your dreams You can find it at your day job somewhere south of hell your gut to guide you. The story is not for anyone else to tell. Go down the rabbit hole and out the other side. You can't go home in the middle of the magic carpet ride. You gotta greet the sun before his lovely dawn moon. You can't forsake the journey for the safety of your room. Until you learn your Learn to see and hear everybody loud and clear But the truth comes down in riddles that are safe enough to share That's how it is in songs you see And stripes always looked good on me Whether or not I'm really there Heavy is the burden of the wise ones When no one understands a word they say The Jabberwock never bothered anyone But nobody believes him to this day Hey, and why should they? If I leave my grin behind, remind me that we're all mad here and it's okay. Sun up, sun down, the shadows find me out in Wonderland, Wonderland. Nobody knows the way, but if you find it in your dreams, you can find it at your day job somewhere south of hell. Take the path to left or right with just your gut to guide you. The story is not for anyone else to tell. Down the hole and out the other side. You can't go home in the middle of the magic carpet ride. You gotta greet the sun before his lovely daughter moon. You can't forsake the journey for the safety of your room until you learn your lesson. Is it the 
stripes or the spots you see? Was it hearts or diamonds, baby, brought you here to me? Darling, you know better than to trust a pack of cards. What have we learned? The world is never as mad as it could be. Never as mad as it could be. We are all a little mad here at uh, Late Night in the Midlands Radio Network, but uh, yeah, it's definitely okay. I don't mind being a little mad. Hello again. My name is Ira Robinson, and you guys are listening to Late Night in the Midlands. Uh, Michael Vera is off tonight due to weather issues, but he should be back and uh, in full force again tomorrow evening with you guys. I'm not sure right offhand who he's got coming on to the show, but you can go to the show schedule at lnmradionetwork.com and uh, take a look. Um, it's, it's right there at the uh, top of the menu, this week's schedule. You can't miss it. So, uh, uh, Byron, we are back and this has been a really fascinating conversation so far. I've really been enjoying it. Um, we do have time to take phone calls. If you guys want to call in, it's two six zero four nine four three nine three seven. And in the meantime, I have a couple of questions that came in from the chat room for you. Okay. Uh, one of them is in regards to the afterlife. What does the Urantia uh, papers have to say about the afterlife? The Urantia book is one, one of the, one of the, one of the best sources of, of knowledge of what happens after death. It, it states that it's, it's an ascension cosmology rather than a reincarnation system. <clears throat> we don't reincarnate back to this planet, um, although there is a technical case of reincarnation that is um, not very important, really. So this is an ascension cosmology, or what they call the ascension scheme. And what we're doing here is creating souls that will, and in a way it's the whole purpose of space and time uh, evolution, is to generate hearty beings who choose the good and the true and the beautiful, who then, after death, have a soul that is worthy of survival, survival, <clears throat> so that you can live on an eternal life. And, you know, this is in the ranch book, it's not, you know, they give you your, your little harp and you uh, float in the clouds and play your harp. It's actually civilizations in these higher worlds. These are actual worlds. They're, they're planets with populations, but they're in another higher dimension. <clears throat> but, but in these dimensions, these worlds appear to be uh, physical, and in fact they are material, but they're higher materials. Um, and so you're literally standing on a sphere in a higher world, living a life, and interacting with uh, people from other planets, actually, from not just from here, but they're ascended from other planets. And it's sort of like a class uh, moving uh, through high school and into college. You've graduated, so to speak, into college now, and, you know, it's a different composition of students, and they have uh, more advanced uh, 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 classes. And, in fact, it is like being in class. Universe is one big school. <clears throat> but it's you know it's not a uh, it's not an oppressive educational school <laughs> regime. It's an enlightened school. It's a school of of learning about love and learning about science and learning about mysteries. And we are in a kind of school um, uh, forever. And we're always learning, growing, and eventually, in the end of the story, is you ascend various levels until you are invited into the central universe that we talked about before. 
you, you're invited to meet the eternal beings in the central universe, and that's a very big jump from here. <clears throat> so you have to qualify for it. And you have to be like a hundred times more enlightened than Buddha <laughs> to, to qualify for that. And we will in the distant future. All of us will qualify, that is, if we do survive and choose to survive. And so we have this very, very high destiny. And <clears throat> it's really one of those two or three chief teachings of the Rancha book is that we do have this high high destiny in the afterlife to become eternal beings and, and, and utterly enlightened uh, beings in, a, in an eternal life. Well, that's pretty fascinating, I think. Um, with the other universes, I mean, if you, if you think about it in another universe, for example, um, physics can work completely differently. You know, we're not, we wouldn't be constrained by the physics of this universe because the physics over there could be set up in a completely different way and things could act and react, uh, you know, in non-Newtonian ways, for instance, there might be a completely different uh, organization of laws there, just as one example. Um, one question that I would have then that's, uh, I guess, tied to that then is do we need to have duality in all of the uh, these other uh, ascended realms like we do here in order to understand the difference between, you know, like you can't understand love without first understanding the other side of things, you know, or or at least uh, not be exposed to the entirety of love without having an understanding of what's going on on the other side as well. You can't see the the darkness without the light and so on and so forth, you know. Um, so do, does that uh, also come as a requirement with these other realms, perhaps? Yes, because uh, you're still in evolution. You know, it's, you're in higher worlds, but they're still in they're in they're really still in space and time. But they're just in a higher dimension of space and time, so to speak. They are still evolving. These worlds are all evolutionary, <clears throat> and not until you get to the central universe, you know, far distant times, do you get beyond duality. In other words, in the central universe, there there really is no contrasting shadow, you know, really of, of evil. You're now uh, far, far, far beyond that in, a, in, a perf in perfect worlds with perfect beings. And these beings have never known what it's like to be experiential, to actually be having to make these choices between evil and good. They have no idea what that is. And that's one of the purposes of the universe is that the eternal beings learn from us we're their teachers. They, they crave to know what it's like to be experiential. And, of course, we crave to know what it's like to be non-dual, beyond good and evil, you know, beyond all of this struggle. And so there's this grand marriage uh, that, is, uh, that is orchestrated in the central universe from the ascent, what we'll call the ascending humans, the ascenders, and the eternals. That, that's an advanced topic in the Arantia book, but but a very uh, a very thrilling one, Ira. I find the topic really fascinating myself. It's it's one that I think about a lot. You know, what is what would it be like to live in in a, a place that didn't have to have that kind of uh, dualism with it? And I know that a lot of people, especially in the uh, the New Age front of things, they like to try to push the idea that we don't have to have the duality or that the duality doesn't exist and so on and so forth. But I don't really ever ascribe to that idea because, you know, I, I've experienced life. So you know, <laughs> the one thing I, I, uh, I've always understood as far as the um, the creators are concerned is that the the reason why we were created is to have the experiences. So it falls right in line with what you were saying there, that uh, we were actually created to have the experiences, but actually to teach them uh, through these experiences. And and one thing maybe to add to that, I think we're at the end of our time, but it's it, and it's an advanced concept about which I'm writing a book, which if people sign up my website, they'll see this book. It's It's on the very subject of what is the soul and who is sort of the oversoul? Because the Rancho book has this incredible notion that there's a part of God that receives all of our experience into himself. And all the experiential beings on all the planets, this part of God is like the Akashic record of all of their lives. And as they evolve, he evolves. 
And as they perfect, he perfects. And at the far end of this whole experiment, everyone in the space-time universes has become enlightened. And when that happens, this part of God becomes a person. He personalizes. Uh, he's like a record of everything, but then suddenly he becomes a person. And this person personifies all of us in himself as the personification of all the struggles of evolution. So, you know, we could leave, leave your listeners with that, that idea. We still have actually about 20 minutes if you still oh, want to go with oh, it. Yeah. Okay, well then um, we can keep going. All right. Then yeah, I was going to say we, we still have plenty of time if you wanted to uh, to cover more in there if you uh, if you so desire. I, I definitely uh, – I love that concept. The one thing that I've thought over the years, and maybe this kind of uh, goes into it a little bit, is that uh, like for example our universe was created out of a being that had evolved itself to the point where it has um, become like everything. It has experienced everything that it possibly can. And so then to be able to experience more, it shatters itself into many, many, you know, hundreds of trillions upon trillions of different um, atoms to go through the whole experience again and experience all things anew, basically, as if it had never experienced it before. Or perhaps, uh, you know, like I said, setting up a whole new universe of different laws that would uh, give a, a whole new stem of different experiences. Well, in a way, that 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 is the you know that, that, that's that, those are theological concepts, <laughs> you know, so, so because <laughs> you, you, we say that God uh, uh, is the creator, and that meaning that God was alone and decided to create beings, and you know, in this case, of course, it's trillions of beings. So why did God do that? Well so that God could see what it's like to be finite rather than infinite and to ha kind of have to fight your way back, so to speak. And um, this, is, this is not done in a kind of mechanistic way. It's done in a loving way. It's a lovingly creating children that he, she loves and nurtures to evolve and come back to him. And each one is like a window on on things that God does not have. I mean, God doesn't... God is not literally me experiencing my experience. I'm having the experience, and God is like watching the movie of my experience, so to speak, um, and is watching everybody having these experiences. And, you know, God doesn't waste anything. God is conserving all the experiences. As I mentioned, God has actually got a part of God, of, the, of God's self, that is a summation of everything that God is witnessing in us. And that's kind of an unusual idea, but it's, it makes sense because, you know, God doesn't stand off in the skies indifferent to us. You know, that, that is the, that is the, that's the idea of, of de deism rather than theism. Deism right. says God is indifferent, sort of sets us in motion, and then he backs, backs off and, you know, does something else. He doesn't care about us, but... Uh, we're, we're, you know, theism uh, states that God is engaged uh, in every moment with us, cares, and is the, is is the our source and our destiny. So, you know, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and it it does fall pretty much right within what with what I was describing, just kind of like in a little bit of a different way. Um, I find it to be really interesting to think about, you know, in, in the middle of the night, I guess you could say the thought that, uh, you know, there's this being who's kind of eating popcorn, watching the movie of my life, you know? Um, but the, the one thing that I could add to that, I guess, is that the fact that there has never in the existence of anything ever been somebody that's like me that has gone through the exact experiences that I've gone through. So I, as this individual person that I am, am a, a completely unique individual and I can contribute then through that uniqueness to this thing that some people refer to as being God or the creator or, or however you want to refer to it. Uh, there in Iro, uh, we can see increasingly see how well, you know, the Urantia book, because that is another great teaching of the Urantia book is, is the uniqueness of each person. And this uniqueness is unique in all of eternity, uh, in, in all realms. You are totally unique. We are not uniform in our personality. And we 
are uniform in other respects. But yes, we not only have this uniqueness, but we have freedom within it. So we're given uh, a, the Ranch book calls it personality. In, in you know psychology, we mean something different by personality. We mean behavior. But in the Ranch book, personality is actually like an entity that is bestowed on on you, kind of bestowed on protoplasm, like on the on the infant in the womb. This is the person, the personhood is a bestowal from the father and this is unique in all eternity what a precious thing and that that's why we say we're made in the image of god but each of us is a different image from god so like you said you know previously it's like god fragments himself into you know trillions of little pieces and each one's special and each one's like kind of a fractal in a way and uh, this is part of the divine, plus sort of like the mathematics of the whole thing, because if you multiply the numbers of you know, unique perspectives infinitely, then this gives God like an infinite movie show <laughs> that he can sit back and eat his popcorn and watch all this thing and, and, and have this unique knowledge that, that only we have. You know, So we're giving this incredible contribution now if we decided uh, to get with the program and develop virtues and ethics and morals meaning we decide to align with God with our creator then all the better because he can watch a very pleasant movie <laughs> of us growing and becoming healthy and spiritual uh, but we have the freedom to not do that and in fact, the angels have the freedom to not do that, which is why we could have had the Lucifer Rebellion. It's hard to believe that angels can go dark, but they too have personhood. They too have free will. They too are unique, and they can they can get off the rails. And of course, so can we. But that's, that's the whole point: is that you know, God is not mechanical. God is it loves us to have freedom and uh, come back to him because we want to. I think that the idea of free will is absolutely essential because through that free will, we do come up with these unique experiences that then add to that uh, ultimate formation of God, you know? Right, so because, you know, in the, the notion of the human soul, which uh, uh, I'm finishing my book on, um is that every unique person chooses uniquely uh, what they're going to do, and each thing that they experience is its like every time you have an experience, the universe hits the save button. It saves it as your soul. It's in you, and you're, that's why we, you know, when we speak of people having a life review in, their, in, the, in a near-death experience, as we mentioned before, there's a complete record of your life. Now, whether this is the record that the angel has or is it the record that's in your soul, I don't know. I think they're probably the same thing. And But, you know, imagine the richness of this. Uh, it, it's sort of like a, having a, you know, great, like a great novel by Dostoevsky where you have all these different characters and each character is really, really unique and what a rich novel it turns out to be. You have all these strange characters kind of growing up together. And um, so, you know, the divine person wants to have absolute variety, absolute diversity. You know, the, you know that's why each of us is created unique and not like robots, uh, because that's what's beautiful. You know, the beauty is in the fact that there's uh, there, there are, is is unique uniqueness and difference. Uh, but when 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 you find when you unify all of this far flung uniqueness and and diversity, when you unify it, that's beautiful. <clears throat> and and that's that's what God God supplies the, the unification of it, the unity of it. But we supply the diversity, you know, through our uniqueness, through our freedom. Right. So not not to get too philosophical here, Ira. 
Well, I love philo- uh, philosophy myself. Sorry, my uh, tongue decided to twist there for a moment. I love that subject myself. But yeah, that's a definitely a long topic in and of itself. Um, one question that I uh, had come in from the chat regarding the rebellion is um, with the subjects that we were just discussing here. Would the celestials actually be considered to be angry against the rebellion, uh, these these uh, ones that have gone dark, based upon the fact that they have caused these different unique experiences to occur? And with what you were saying earlier, the um, the fact that we are, I, I guess, sort of ultimately going to be better off because of what we've gone through. So, so the question is, literally, were, were they angry about the situation that, that right. they stepped into? Yeah, yeah. angry. Uh, it's an interesting way to put it. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, these these are these are the so-called fallen angels, and um, you know, it's it's in it's in it's in Christianity, it's in Islam that there were these fallen angels, and yes, they have they have they have they have sort of dark emotions. You might think of them as being angry. Yes, indeed. And um, they, um, it, it's, I'm remiss because I have not mentioned the fact that we have been told, this is post, post-Durantia book, we've been told in the teaching mission, the new channelings, we've been told that <clears throat> all of those so-called dark angels, fallen angels, have been, have been judged. They've been, they've been adjudicated. Literally, they had a court case in heaven. And in the court case, they were uh, adjudicated and they were removed from planet Earth. And the date for that is 1987. Now, this is uh, disputed, uh, you know, around the edges. Uh, we don't have, a, you know, the, the clarity that we have in the Arantia book on this. But it seems to me correct that this occurred and sort of the, 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 the status of these so-called fallen angels is that some were that they were taken to a kind of a prison world, and uh, they could choose rehabilitation. And so uh, many, uh, we you know, we're told most of them did, but those who did not, that remained defiant, uh, were given the option to choose their own death. And we're we're told that Lucifer. Satan and Caligastia all chose sort of to snuff themselves out rather than get rehabilitated. They were rebels to the end. And uh, But, you know, the, the, the way they, they, they tell this is that, yeah, these dudes are beings that had dark emotions. These are beings who, whose belief system stated that God is a myth. In other words, the loving God is a myth. And the universe is not built around love. The universe is built around around will. It's built around self-assertion. It's it's it has to do with freedom and doing what you will, and uh, rather than uh, conforming to the uh, love and the will of of God. So you know, if if you reject all of that, you're going to become a pretty distorted personality. So, you know, yes to that question, you might even think of them as having been angry and perverse and exploitative. Very in fact, interesting. You know, that that's what Jesus was pointing out in, in certain passages. I've noticed that too as well. I used to uh I used to be very religious myself. Uh, I was on the path to become a, a Baptist pastor myself. And uh, so it's uh, it's interesting some of the, the side passages that are contained within like different sections of the New Testament that show that exact thinking, you know, that right along those lines. One other question that came from the chat room then is in relation to what you were discussing earlier about the um, – the events that occurred there in our prehistory. Um, so with the, the idea of the Nephilim, what, uh, what could, what could you say, or what does the Urantia papers say is, uh, in regards to the Nephilim and are they still in existence today based upon the pathway of history that we've taken? 
Well, you know, uh, Sitchin says that they're more or less the Anunnaki coming from, you know, the 12th planet. And the Ranch Book states that the Nephilim are the, the, the race it's it's a little convoluted <laughs> actually because because they had a rebellion right so there were these avatar beings I mentioned that were they were incarnate in human bodies half a million years ago they were uh, able to uh, they had they had the ability to reproduce they were not supposed to reproduce but they had the ability to do it and they also had the ability the ability to interbreed with the indigenous humans. And so that's who the Nephilim are. The Nephilim uh, were the uh, were a kind of a new race that arose after the Lucifer Rebellion, going back 200,000 years ago. And this race was of origin from the members of the staff. They're known as, by the way, the prince's staff, the planetary prince staff, the 100 incarnate beings they uh they were uh able to uh reproduce and they the the race that they created is known as it has a name is called the nodites they spread out in the mesopotamia area and they are the group that are, are referred to as the philom and they are one of the ancestor races of the sumerians uh, they had higher attributes. However, they were warlike and, and inclined to the dark. Uh, so uh, they uh, they created quite a quite a civilization, you know, very very ancient civilization, very 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 ancient, with writing, with mathematics, with some technology, and they were uh, they were renegades. And uh, we didn't mention that there was another race that was created by Adam and Eve. And they came um, uh, much later, 37,000 years ago. That's a huge subject, and we're almost at the end. But um, they also spawned a race on our planet, and that's told about in the Bible. And, and the mix of that race and the race of the Nodites are the true ancestors of civilization. And uh, what we call the Sumerians, the Sumerians emerge out of nowhere with all of this language, writing, math, you know, astronomy. Uh, it comes from these ancestor races. It's probably worth saying, Ira, that uh, we have uh, some evidence, uh, significant evidence, archaeological evidence of some of this which I was involved with, uh, with in the Urantia book states that there truly was an Adam and Eve. Uh, it's, it sounds kind of bizarre, but there really was. It sounds like a crazy myth from the Bible, but it says it was a these, these beings that came much, much later, like I said, 37,000 years ago, to uplift us biologically by interbreeding with us. It states that they incarnated here as a couple Adam and Eve and their mission was to uh, was to uh, up, upstep upgrade our genetics you know as, 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 as far out as it sounds it states that they were uh, they were stationed on uh, the island of Cyprus in the eastern Mediterranean and uh, I know you know the story Ira from the Rancho book <clears throat> that they also uh, aborted their mission because the angelic host of the planet was was dark and and basically um, interfered with and uh, led them to make very bad decisions and cause their mission to be cut short and defaulted, but not before they had created a new race of their own children, and that race interbred and those stories come down to us in the myths of, uh, of the Middle East, in uh, Samaria mainly, but also uh, other myths in, in ancient, very ancient Vedic myth and, uh, and other, other stories that are totally garbled. <coughs> so um, 
you know, that's that, that you know, and understanding the whole entire scheme of the Arantia book, which really admittedly takes months and years, it is important to know that there were two great dispensations. The first one, 500,000 years. The second, 37,000 years. That actually left behind uh, beings that we think of as sort of like the ancient ancient astronauts. And it is my belief that this is this is the solution to the ancient astronaut problem. And uh, by the way, uh, the, the the main guy on ancient uh, ancient aliens on the History Channel, uh, you know, I mean, uh, the guy named Sukalos. Yes. Giorgio. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I spoke with him um, at Contact in the Desert about this. And, uh, you know, I asked him if he could put this on, uh, on the History Channel. I asked him face to face. And, and the first thing he said was, I have a Urantia book. I've read it. You know, and I, I said, well, hey, you know, maybe you should, you know, maybe you should start talking about it. And just at that point, I got interrupted. There was in a line of about 200 people trying to talk to him. And but I gave him uh, some of my materials, including uh, uh, the, uh, some of the books I've mentioned and uh, the um, a video of myself that you can find on YouTube that introduces this. Uh, I gave him. Uh, um, I should mention before we close that there is a couple of new books that, uh, that I've published and edited, which are the transmissions from Christ Michael and Mother Spirit. And the, the series is called The Adventure of Being Human. Anyway, I gave him copies of that. And uh, so let's see, maybe we'll get this on the History Channel. That would be really interesting. I think that uh, it, it would be a really good telling, you know, I mean, a different version of the story. And I think that, you know, the fact that we have these different versions of our history is really important. We have to understand the all of them you know we really need to look into all of them because we don't know you know we don't know where we came from or where we're going and all of this kind of stuff and again like i was saying towards the beginning of things i think that it's absolutely essential to know and understand what it is to be us so that we can progress forward from here we have about five minutes left i want to give you the floor to be able to to get out anything that you want to get out any uh websites that you want to give to the people. We will have you linked up on um, the website, lmradionetwork.com, uh, with the archive of this show, uh, all of the websites that you give. We will have you linked up there so that people can find you very easily. But I want to go ahead and give you the floor to get out anything that you'd like to get out. Uh, thank you, Ira. So first of all, thank you to you, Ira, for the terrific questions. And and for you know being being uh, with me through all of this, and uh, we've, you and I have had a little adventure. Um, all of my materials relevant to the Rancha book are at the one website I've given you, which is evolving-souls s o u l s dot org. On YouTube, we have a channel which is Evolving Souls Community, and uh, our most recent books I just mentioned. It's uh, the Adventure of Being Human, and there's two books in that series. Just look under Adventure of Being Human. Um, and a um, previous book is called, um, um, I'm getting fatigued, <laughs> I can't remember the name of our books, <laughs> uh, he Healing a Broken World. And um, there are other books, there's some, this very wonderful book uh, by uh, Donna D'Angelo, a close colleague of mine, it's called Teach Us to Love, Teach Us to Love by Donna D'Angelo which is a, an introduction to the core spiritual teachings of the Arantia book. And it is a beautiful book. Um, there, there are other titles. There's one called The Secret Revelation, which is about the book of Revelation in the Bible compared to the prophecies of the Arantia book. It's called The Secret Revelation by Stella Religa and, and myself. Uh, so those are the main ones. There's another one that's just out of print. It's probably our best book, and we're going to print it again, but you can find it used. It's called The Center Within. The Center Within, Lessons from the Heart of the Urantia Revelation. That was actually a, a kind of a big seller, and um, we sold out of it. And that has the, the core lessons as well. And one more, I've written a book called One World Democracy, 
one world democracy is is uh, derived from this teaching also it states that the whole world will be united we will reform the united nations the united nations will become a democracy will be able to elect representatives to the United Nations. How do you like that? And that's in our future. <clears throat> Rather than a top-down new world order, we're going to have a bottom-up one world democracy. So you can look for that book, which I co-authored. I'm the principal author. And uh, my forthcoming uh, book, uh, which is called Soul Making Dynamics, it's not uh, on Amazon yet, will be soon. And that is an introduction to the teachings about the soul, the afterlife, and the Arantia book. And, um, and look for that to come out uh, rather soon. I think that's probably about it, Ira. Um, uh, everyone, uh, please uh, get yourself uh, your Arantia book. They're really inexpensive. They're subsidized uh, by wealthy people to make them really inexpensive. You can also download it free as an e-book. Um, it's uh, in various public... Publicate. The best one to get is the one that's got an index. So look for the Arantia book with an index. It's less than $20. It should be $50. You know, get the text and put it on your shelf and consider it to be like an encyclopedia. You know, you don't just sit down and read the encyclopedia, but you want to look something up. You want to look up uh, the life of Jesus. Pull it down and look it up. Look up anything in his life. You're not going to be, believe it if you haven't seen it. That, that, and if you love Jesus, you're not going to believe how much detail there is about his life. You know, any, any one story in the Bible, which is a paragraph, can be, you know, ten pages in the Arantia book. So if you always wondered about, you know, the miracles or about, you know, his family or, or the apostles or, you know, the resurrection, for example, the Arantia book says that, yes, indeed, he did resurrect, really true resurrection. But not just a few times. He had he had 19 resurrection appearances, and that is some of the most sublime reading you can do. What did Jesus say in his resurrection when he appeared? Uh, in one case, he appeared to a, a group of about a hundred women. You know, what did he say when he appeared in Alexandria, Egypt? You know, these are things that didn't make it into the Bible. And you know, just just that alone to get the ranch book and read the biography of Jesus. Is the, is the thing I recommend the most. It's the most important knowledge to have is the life of Jesus and what he taught, um, which uh, is all there in, in the text. Absolutely wonderful. I love that idea, too, definitely. <laughs> There's so much that's missing out of his life. You know, just it goes from the time that he was 12 years old to nothing, you know, till he was like 30. So, you know, there's a whole gap of time there that... Uh, Never gets talked about. All those missing years are, are recounted in the Arantia book. It's fascinating to know what he did. It states that he was actually a householder. His father had died. His father, Joseph, died. Uh, but there were eight siblings, and he was their father. He was the oldest Jewish son. So he actually had the experience of raising children on this earth. And so all of all of us, all of those out there who are parents, just know that Jesus was a parent. It wasn't his <laughs> biological children, it was his siblings. And, and most of the time we need to have the patience of Job to uh, deal with the children we have. <laughs> yeah, at least back then they didn't have cell phones and, uh, you know, iPads. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Probably well, a little easier for Jesus. <laughs> Byron, it's been, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you tonight. I really appreciate you coming on here to uh, Late Night in the Midlands and, and uh, dealing with me instead of Michael tonight. But uh, I'm glad that he took the night off because I definitely wanted to have this conversation with you. So. <laughs> well, what a great pleasure, Ira. And I uh, hope we'll do it again sometime and, and uh, tell Michael I'd uh, love to meet him. Definitely. And, uh, again, thanks, thanks for having me on. Definitely. Well, thank you so much and I uh, hope to talk to, you, talk to you again soon. Okay, let's do. Thanks bye, a lot. Bye-bye. Bye so folks, there you go. Byron Belitzos and uh, you can find him linked up at lnmradionetwork.com. The archive for this show will be in place a little bit late tonight. Unfortunately, I have about four more hours of recording to do after this show is over, but I will get to it as soon as possible. I promise. And, uh, in the meantime, you know, if, um, if you agree or disagree or don't agree with everything that he had to say or that the uh, Urantia book has to say about uh, the way that things work or the way that things formed, that's okay. 
we're allowed to disagree on things. I don't always agree with everything that it has to say either, but uh, the fact that it is a different form of knowledge and a, a new way of thinking is to me, I think, very important. We really do need to expose ourselves to uh, everything that we have available to us in order to understand where we come from and where we're going from here. Lord knows we really do need the help. So uh, in the meantime, uh, Michael Vera should be back with you guys tomorrow night. And if not, you guys will hear me again. And uh, hopefully you don't mind that. Uh, my name is Ira Robinson. I'm normally the host of Open Eyes, which you can hear at uh, openeyesnetwork.com or uh, here at the LNM Radio Network at lnmradionetwork.com. I'm on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I also host uh, or co-host the uh, Brothers at Arms show, which is on Thursdays at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and the co-host of Adventures in Autism, which you guys can hear here at uh, lnmradionetwork.com on uh, Mondays at noon at midnight. Uh, in the meantime, for Michael Vera, unfortunately, off tonight, but uh, you guys can deal. Thank you so much for being here. I definitely appreciate it. Keep safe out there and have fun. And until next time. Thank you so much, as always, for listening.